Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We will be getting started in just a moment. We still have quite a number of people logging in, so we're going to give just another minute or so, and then we'll get going. We are going to get started. Welcome. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us for our mulch and compost for Waterwise Gardens uh, workshop. This is not the most glorious topic. We don't show the very prettiest pictures, though there will be some pretty pictures in this, but it, it's really a nuts and bolts topic that is uh, so important for success with gardening of uh, any sort it is really uh, just kind of one of those nuts and bolts things where we also often see people with the best of intentions go wrong, do a bunch of work and spend a bunch of money on stuff that's not really helping their garden out at all. So very happy to uh, share this with you and hopefully it will be a uh, useful tool in your gardening success. Before we get started, a couple of quick notes. You can download all of the slides from this presentation at the first link here where my cursor is right now at cbwcd.org slash presentations. That's cbwcd.org slash presentations. And I'm going to type that into the chat now in case you need to refer back to that later. Presentations. Sorry. Quick typo, cbwcd.org slash presentations. If you go to that page, that's just going to be a list of all of the workshop topics that we have taught recently. And you can right click and kind of save the link file for any of the presentations, including compost and mulch or mulch and compost for waterwise gardens, in case you want to refer back to any of these slides as a point of reference. It's a single PDF file that will have one page for each of the slides. This is also recorded uh, on our YouTube channel. If you go to cbwcd.org slash YouTube, that'll take you right to our playlist of all of our recorded workshops. There is a very similar recording up there from a past time that I taught this class online right now. And then eventually with some editing, we'll post the recording of the workshop from today as well. That's cbwcd.org slash YouTube. Also, lots of recordings of lots of different topics related to waterwise and California native gardening there, as well as uh, all sorts of content related to efficient irrigation. So definitely worth checking that out if you have not seen that already. And before we jump into it, I want to tell you just a little bit about the organization that I'm from, who we are and what we do. We are the Waterwise Community Center. Formally, we are a local government agency serving the western edge of San Bernardino County called the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. We were formed by a public vote way back in 1949, specifically for water conservation. So we don't supply anybody's water at their house or business. We work very closely with the local water retailers who do that work, but essentially we exist to preserve and protect the Chino groundwater basin, which provides about half of the water for our local communities. It's a huge source for a community in Southern California. And we exist to basically be there to protect and preserve it. And we do that through three main ways. We uh, percolate water. The kind of bread and butter for our agency has been literally capturing water that would flow out of our communities during storm events and out towards the ocean and basically retain that water in large properties that are basically holes in the ground. And through natural processes, uh, that water 
gets cleaned as it trickles down through layers of sands and gravels and recharges our groundwater basin. But we also know that adding to the supply side of water doesn't do that much good if within our local communities, we're not using that water that we save wisely. So we also do lots of demonstration. We have about a three acre demonstration facility with all sorts of different approaches to California native and water wise gardens being demonstrated free and open to the public six days a week at our headquarters in Montclair just south of the 10 freeway. And we also do lots of education for all sorts of different groups from curriculum integrated K through 12 field trips to programs for our local community members where we'll actually go out and take a look at their irrigation systems and advise professional training, as well as workshops, both in person at the Waterwise Community Center, as well as online. So if you're interested in learning more about what we do, the single, Easiest thing you can do is sign up for our once a month email newsletter at cbwcd.org slash newsletter. And I can type that into the chat right now, cbwcd.org slash newsletter. And we don't share your email with anyone else, just one email a month, letting you know what we have going on. And you can find links there to connect to all sorts of other stuff that we do. And so then the last part of the introduction is telling you a little bit about who I am and why I'm even talking to you about this. Good morning. My name is Scott Kleinrock. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager here at the WaterWise Community Center. And I come from a background uh, focused on the urban landscape, uh, whether it's commercial sites, home gardens. I'm a passionate home gardener. And for the last uh, 16, 17 years now, that's really kind of what I've been doing. Uh, started in this industry by doing kind of horticulture directly, uh, have a master's degree in landscape architecture. I worked for many years in the public gardens world doing landscape design, horticulture management, as well as construction management before coming here to be able to share what I really love doing with the community at the WaterWise Community Center. And so since most of you are going to be focused on home gardens in our audience today, this is also really going to be informed by the home gardening uh, that I've been doing over the last uh, 16, 17 years, which includes a lot of California native landscapes that I've used to grow succulents quite a bit and as well that whole time uh, working with fruit trees and edible plants as well and throughout all of that you know mulch is very relevant whether it's for getting gardens established for continuing to push the soil in the right direction or for having your plants have the best chance for success in our hot dry Southern California climate. This is also going to be relevant to people in other areas, but really we have a California bent in this class because anything we can do to uh, push our gardens in the right directions with some of the challenges that we face or make sure that we don't push them in the wrong directions is really going to give us a leg up. So that's a little bit about me. And this is now your chance to tell me a little bit about you with this quick opening poll you should see being launched in your Zoom screen. So please just quickly click through. The answers gives us some metrics that we use for our program tracking, finding who's joining us and where they're from. Everyone is very welcome to join us today. If you don't come from one of the communities listed on question number three, please type into the chat where you're joining us from. It's always interesting to see who's joined us. Same thing as well for question number four. If you found out about us through something not listed, please let us know. Did see a question on the chat come in from Joanne. Will this be available to, available to view online? Yes, if you go back, for those of you just joining us to the top of the chat, if you scroll up, there's going to be two links. One is cbwcd.org slash presentations. And that link will take you to uh, download links for all of the slides. And there's also cbwcd.org slash YouTube. Uh, today, you'll be able to already view or review a 
uh, past time where I taught this class, a recording of that, and then going forward uh, sometime, probably towards the end of next week, after a little bit of editing, this class will be posted as well. We have people joining us from Texas, Washington, Florida, Panama. Welcome, welcome. Las Vegas, San Antonio. So for those of you in drier climates, uh, the mulch part will, will really uh, definitely just completely apply. Uh, for those of you in other sorts of climates, when we get to the compost part after we get through the mulch, that's really pretty much going to apply universally. Some of the stuff from the mulch will apply for you as well, but specifically for those people in the, the drier climates. Okay, thank you very much, everybody who filled out the poll. If you didn't get to it, don't worry about it. We are going to move forward. Oops. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so here's what we're going to cover today. First, we'll talk about what are mulch and compost. A, a lot of first-time gardeners or people just getting started get the two of those confused, so we're going to clear that up right at the beginning. Then we're going to cover our mulch section. Uh, some of you will compost or be interested in composting, uh, but all of you probably will have some use of mulch for mulch in your garden. So we're gonna start with mulch. It's also a little bit simpler. We'll talk about mulch types. We'll talk about sources, how to choose the mulch that's best for you and how to use it. Then we'll move into compost and we'll talk about the types of compost and composting. We'll talk about how to best use compost. We'll talk about the containment options for your compost pile, mostly with a bent towards uh, people in urban areas who don't have a ton of space to have these huge uncontained compost piles. But even for those of you in rural areas, if you're not having huge piles and turning it with a tractor and things like that, uh, some of the, the smaller uh, compost containment options are really everything you would need. For, for example, composting all of the kitchen scraps coming out of the uh, family kitchen that even you know, cooks a lot, does their own gardening. And some of those containment options also help keep the critters out in much more than an open pile would. And then we're gonna end with my recommended containers and procedures for composting and worm composting. Uh, I've been doing both of those for a, large, a long time uh, and it can be a lot of work or it can be a little bit of work. Uh, it can be your main hobby. I know people who are so into composting, they're not really that into gardening. They just, they're mostly into composting and it takes up so much of their time that they love it. That's great. For most of us and myself included, uh, I want to compost, but it's not really like a whole hobby. It's just kind of part of you know, taking care of my household, uh, doing my thing from an environmental perspective, and I want to get good compost from my garden. So I'll, I'll show you kind of how I've settled on and I've been very happy with uh, kind of the, the low maintenance techniques I've been using for the last number of years. And so in there, about halfway through, we'll also take a brief break and questions. You're welcome to ask questions as we go. Uh, for asking questions, please use the Q&A function. So if you look in your kind of at the bottom of your screen where you have the different buttons you can press to engage the different functions in Zoom, you will see one button that says Q&A and has two little text bubbles. That's the one to use to ask questions because I see those on the back end on my side all kind of organized and I can answer them and check them off. The chat is there really just for uh, comments. When I always read all the comments at the end, when people put questions into the chat, they kind of tend to get lost and I might miss them. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A as we go. And then as I stop in between different subsections, I'll check if questions came in and answer as many of those as I can as we go. So with that, let's proceed. And here's the basic idea. Using mulch and compost correctly helps keep your plants happy, helps keep your garden happy overall. Uh, that's, that's the big idea. Mulch and compost can provide tons of benefits. And essentially what we are doing with mulch and compost at the root is using them to provide conditions a little bit more like the natural conditions that the plants in our gardens are adapted to or will most thrive in. 
Now there's plenty of exceptions to that, but, but kind of think about it uh, in that way. When we grow gardens, even if we're kind of growing native gardens for most of us, we are not growing just the plants that would naturally grow exactly where we are. And even beyond that, for many of us urban gardeners, the soils in our neighborhood, the urban heat island effect, the conditions over time, the microbiology in the soil have changed so much due to development in the history of any particular site, yard, garden, that the conditions are no longer the natural conditions. So even if we were growing just native plants that maybe historically would have grown there, the conditions have changed. And so we can use mulch, or in some cases, we can use compost to basically provide the sweet spot for the plants we are trying to grow and be successful within our gardens. So how do you know what that is? Well, what we're going to look at is if we know a little bit about what our plants want and a bit about our options for mulching compost, we have a great tool for gardening su success. Because what we want to do with mulching compost for an orange tree is going to be different than what we'd want to do with mulch for our native sage plant. Uh, and so we're going to kind of explore that. Once you understand those concepts, it makes a lot more sense for what to do. So what is mulch? Mulch is anything that covers the surface of the soil. So sometimes people uh, kind of shorthand say mulch, and what they mean is a wood chip mulch, but it doesn't necessarily just mean wood chips. Uh, wood chips are a common mulch, but gravel put in a layer over the soil surface is a gravel mulch. Uh, decomposed granite, which we'll look at, is another kind of mulch if it's laid over the surface in a you know, two or three inch normally layer. Sometimes you'll hear them called organic mulch, which basically means something that came from a plant, usually it's wood chips, uh, or inorganic mulch or aggregate mulch, and that means a gravel or a decomposed granite. What, it, what are they there for? Well, for people in hot, dry climates, the, the number one thing is that they reduce evaporation from the soil. So after a landscape is watered, and if you think about the, the moisture in your soil kind of is like a battery. If you give your soil a good deep soak for your plants, you're kind of recharging that battery. And then that battery starts to get depleted. Part of that is from the plants doing what they do for their physiological processes. They use most of that water in a process called evapotranspiration. Uh, but part of that, if the soil is exposed directly to the sun, is just evaporation. The sun beats down on the soil and that evaporates water. And what happens in most types of soil is that as that very top layer that's getting hit directly by the sun dries out, to some degree, the moisture from lower down wants to equalize and it kind of wicks back up a little bit to where then it can continue to then be evaporated from the, the heat or the direct sunlight on the soil. Uh, for those of you remembering your junior high school science, that's capillary action. That's the actual scientific term of, of, of what can happen to allow that, that water to wick back up a little bit. So when you put mulch down, you're shading the soil, you're basically just stopping that process right away. And once you cut out the evaporation part of it, you're holding on to that soil moisture that much better. So that's a good reason to mulch in and of itself. It helps prevent weed seeds from germinating, which depending on the situation in your garden, but for most of us, uh, in especially in urban areas, there's large weed seed banks that have developed over time and might be constantly blowing in from the neighbor's house. And we want to kind of minimize that. There's always going to be weeding in a garden, even with mulch, uh, but it can help prevent weed seeds from germinating. If it is organic, so wood chips or something like that, over time, it will break down and add some organic matter to the soil. If you're working with native or desert plants, they might not really care, depending on the, the exact type of plant where it came from, whether or not there's more organic matter. Uh, but definitely, if you're growing fruit trees and vegetable gardens in a dry climate, and oftentimes even in the wet climate, that building organic matter is just so crucial towards helping your soil hold on to moisture, 
as well as nutrients, as well as supporting the beneficial soil biology, which are so critical in success with especially vegetable gardening and also having fruit trees kind of long-term healthy. That biological component is very important in, in most cases, but when you're working with edible crops, uh, that's just so critical, especially if you're in a hot and dry climate. So all very important. Uh, also important with mulch with native plants as well, especially when they're young and you have to be watering more often is that native plants are for from hot, dry areas. They're in the warm season, pretty sensitive to hot and moist soil. They often didn't evolve to have hot and moist soil, especially in California, where naturally we don't really have much summer rainfall at all. And so one of the most important things we can do during the establishment of our native plants, where we are just going to have to water when it is warm and, and even uh, kind of continued on as our plants are older, if we're watering, is to shade the soil some. You know, we don't need to bury our plants in mulch, but shading that soil helps keep those soil temperatures down. Uh, and so that gives us a little bit more flexibility. As the plants grow in, they start to kind of shade their own soil. But when they're young, shading that soil to keep it a little bit cooler in the summer is another benefit. So that's the kind of rundown from mulch. What about compost? Well, compost is a little bit different. Compost is organic matter, so plant material. Might have manures in it as well, uh, animal manure, something like that. But it's organic matter that's broken down through a process that we commonly call composting. So what does compost do? And we use compost to enrich the soil with organic matter and nutrients. And as it does its thing in the soil and is continued to be broken down or fed on by microorganisms, stimulates their growth in their populations, it helps build soil structure and it helps retain moisture. And it can be made with many different organic materials to start with, but true compost, by the time it's done composting, you can't really see or tell what it started as. It's kind of been broken down into this nice, if it's good compost, should smell great. It can, should kind of smell like the forest floor, uh, kind of even material. And in a vegetable garden, that compost might be used as your mulch layer. You might just top dress with compost and, and you're actually kind of using that as what's covering the top of the soil. Eventually it's going to get mixed in by critters, worms, and things like that. And we'll, we'll all kind of go together. Uh, but that's, that's basically what compost is. And so a uh, good question from Natalie that came in, can leaves be considered mulch? Absolutely. If you have a bunch of trees on your property and they are dropping more leaves than you would necessarily leave in that location, leaves can absolutely, a layer of leaves could be a, a great mulch. If I had an endless source of oak leaves, I'd, I'd use them as a mulch in a, a decent amount of some of the native planting areas that I had. Uh, now, the most important thing for most times is, is to leave the leaves underneath the trees because trees normally thrive on a good relatively deep mulch of uh, their own dropped leaves. But if you have extra ones that fall on pathways or patios, definitely uh, use what you got. There's, in many cases, no point to putting those in your, your green bin to get taken away and then buying in other mulch. So let's look at mulch types. Well, one of the most common in California and in many other places around is mixed ground tree trimmings. And this is something that can either be obtained or purchased, but basically it's what arborists, when they are cutting branches, limbs, twigs, uh, get brought to different facilities and those get ground up. And normally it's uh, species diverse. It, if you can get ground tree trimmings that are a diversity of species, that's, that's always my preference. I also love oak tree trimmings as long as those trees are healthy, but a lot of times you, you, you get what you can get. Uh, and so this is an example of a pile of stuff that I got for free. And you can see there's different things in there. There is a little bit of oak in there. You can tell from the leaves. Uh, this is one of the local commercial products that one of the, the landscape materials yards sells uh, mixed ground tree trimmings of a variety of different sizes. Uh, common 
cheapest, often available for free. And this is kind of what it looks like when it goes down in the landscape. Over time, in a natural style garden, native garden, you can also grow your own and mix things up. So oftentimes when I start a garden, I'll start with two inches or so of this just to kind of get things going. But I, I don't want to go kind of crazy with this in a drier landscape. Uh, if, if you do six, seven inches of this stuff, it can kind of start to create a barrier for those landscapes that aren't being watered very often. With the fruit trees, that's a little bit different. You're watering very often. The mulch never really gets bone dry. But it's really just to kind of get cool the soil, help prevent weed seeds from germinating. Uh, that's all you're doing, you know, don't go crazy with it. And, and for me, it's oftentimes what I say with, uh, with a native or Mediterranean garden, it's kind of one and done with this wood chip mulch. A uh, couple of inches when the plants are spaced far apart before they start to grow in. And over time, the plants start self mulching. And then I'm also using my trimmings for my different shrubs and things like that, or, or smaller branches from trees and cutting them up a little bit more and using those as the mulch. And so, for example, in my garden, this is a small part of my backyard before the plants start to grow in. You can't really even see the design intent yet. Uh, but over time, now that this area is fully grown in with the shrubs, and I just use new mulch every once in a while for the areas that are pathways that stay open. And, you know, mix things up over time as well. So you can see here, this is kind of naturally things just starting still pretty young. These are some dried wildflowers with seeds that the birds are still coming around and eating. Eventually it was cleaned up from here and moved somewhere else. If you're in a high fire danger area, you probably wouldn't be leaving stuff like this around and then mixing in rock and gravel and branches and, and things like that for a natural look. That's what we we're going for in this garden. A lot of very popular for native gardens is a kind of uh, naturalistic look, whatever might look natural for kind of the plant community that you would naturally be in or what you're going for. And so you might start with wood chip mulch because developing that that natural sense and and getting the material like for this, this is all just rock and gravel that was dug out of our garden as we were planting plants over the couple of years we were building this garden. We didn't have that right away. Uh, we didn't really develop that natural sense until later on, but just to get the garden going, a couple of inches of wood chip over everything to shade the soil. And then over time, you might be headed more in this direction. This is another part of my yard. So this was all wood chip to start with, but you can see developing the rock, the gravel, here's the pathway. And then over time, these plants, they never needed mulching again. There are a few leaves dropping here and there, a few trimmings left in between the plants, uh, and it's taking care of itself. It's just to get established. And so here you can see the kind of straw of the wildflowers. And that's great. When the wildflowers are up, there's birds that will land on them and eat through them. But once they're laid out like this, then you'll have a whole other series of birds that prefer to pick seeds off the ground, for example, if you're working with wildflowers or trimmings of your native shrubs that have gone to seed. Uh, so in my yard, we have morning doves, especially and California towhees that are ground seed eaters. And so they'll wait. And then once these are on the ground, we see them around every morning. Birds will also be coming and using this stuff as nesting material uh, in the thin stems that you might use on some of them, especially like if you have a hollow thin stems like native sages that you cut up uh, from their flowering stalks, you'll have different native pollinators and beneficial insects that will nest in those. So you really start to create a lot of additional benefits by cultivating your own natural mulch layer in your garden. And so you can see here, I already showed this slide, but just as an example of this earlier on. And then this is that same area later on. And we had a, a couple of branches die back on this Winifred Gilman sage. It just happens, uh, the plant happily rebounded, but it was a good opportunity to take a picture of this natural mulch layer that has started to develop underneath the sage. And so you can see it's just the natural growth of sage leaves just as they turn over over time, uh, it's just gonna happen. And then a few little bits of prunings and twigs and things like that. And so that's great stuff. 
uh, growing your own. I do get a lot of questions about shredding your own plant material. Uh, and that's up to you and depends on how involved you want to be in the garden, what your budget is. I mean, my, my first thing that I always do is sometimes when I'm pruning, if I need a little bit more mulch, especially if I'm pruning small shrubs where I'm using a hand pruner is I'll just clip a little bit more off of some of my branches and just have some, some small trimmings that go down to add a little bit more mulch. If I want a little bit more mulch down, as long as that's healthy material, that, that diversity and that native plant material or the same plant material of the kind of plants that you are using is always going to be the best stuff rather than bringing more stuff in. Uh, but that could be a lot of work. Depends on the size of your garden. If you have a tiny garden, that might be all you need to do. Uh, for me, I have a kind of large backyard where we have lots and lots of plants. I could not do all of that by hand, and I just produce uh, more organic material than that. So something that I've been doing for a couple of years now is using this small electric shredder, which has been working pretty well. I know some other people who use similar ones, and it's pretty good. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go out and spend a ton of money on a gas powered shredder, uh, unless you have like a big rural property, those things are, those engines uh, are actually cause uh, quite a bit of pollution. Uh, they're super noisy and they could be quite dangerous unless you really know what you're doing. However, they do now make these kind of small electric ones they cost about 200 bucks, depending on the size of your, your yard, may or may not be worth it. Uh, they kind of put things a lot slower through. They're a lot cheaper. They can only shred stuff up to about one inch in diameter. And you kind of have to have the right mix of things has to be a little bit dry. So, it, you know, it's not like uh, absolutely go out and buy this thing, but it's worked pretty well for me. Uh, to some degree, it's almost more like a crimper, especially some of the smaller branches that I put through. It kind of mashes them up, but they're kind of stringy and still together. But in terms of that natural mulch product that I'm interested in creating for different parts of my garden and to not have to put it in the green bin and have it hauled out to the desert and go in a compost pile somewhere out there, it does a pretty good job. It can be pretty time intensive to feed a whole pile of shrub trimmings through the little slot. Uh, but for me, you know, every during the pruning season. So, you know, mostly in my garden spring and fall because a lot of native plants, uh, I put my headphones in, turn on an audio book or some podcasts and I just spend a morning kind of grinding through some stuff and uh, reef touching some of the areas that I like to keep mulched in my garden that aren't doing that kind of self mulching because it's a lower plant density or maybe it's a pathway area or a, a side yard area or something like that to keep my own green trimmings on my own site. Uh, so that's just one option if you think that that would be appropriate for you. So here's just another example of that kind of totally natural mulch. This is uh, near the entrance to Tree of Life Nursery in Orange County and you know just absolutely beautiful and you can see it's just kind of leafy natural leaf drop. There's some stone and things like that you know, beautiful, all you need to cover the ground, absolutely. So where do you get mulch? Well, you can sometimes find it for free in your communities. If you live near anywhere near us, in, where our headquarters is in Montclair, we give away free mulch. It's a partnership with a local company that uh, has a site nearby that that uh, charges arborists to drop off their tree trimming material, and then they grind it all up. They have their own landscaping company, so they uh, they use some of it in their own product projects. Uh, but this uh, green waste site, which is called Green Army, uh, they also donate it to us. And most of the time, we just have a big pile in our parking lot, and the community is welcome to come take as much as they need. Uh, sometimes especially this time of year, we run through it and we always just kind of get it from them when we can. So for example, today, we don't have mulch available, but normally we do. If you are nearby and you're interested in coming and getting some, you can always call the main number for the WaterWise Community Center, Chino Basin Water Conservation District. And uh, during most business hours, someone will answer the phone and you can just ask them if uh, we currently have mulch and we'll let you know. And then you just come bring your own tools, your own containers, 
uh, take what you need. And it's uh, pretty good stuff. It's it's a kind of finer grind for native and water wise plants. Personally, I prefer a little bit of a coarser grind, but at the same time, the price is right. So it's what we use in our demonstration garden. It's what I've been using for the last uh, few years when I was establishing my garden at the place that I live now in Pomona and when I need to touch up my pathways. Uh, and it works great. Again, I wouldn't do six or seven inches of mulch for native plants, but just as that thin layer to get things going, no problem at all. Uh, works pretty well. And so that's free mulch, uh, different utilities. Sometimes cities will, will give away free mulch as well. Uh, I live in the San Gabriel Valley before I lived out in Pomona, close to where I work now. And the city of Pasadena a few times a year would, would have these big piles at some of the parks. And so that's where I would get my free mulch uh, when I lived out there. So you can look for sources near you. If you need a whole bunch of mulch, especially to start a, a new garden in one place, you can look at a service called Chip Drop. Uh, that's an app that you can download. You can read all about it on their website. This is not an endorsement, but uh, it, it is a useful resource uh, for some people. You can't always choose what you get. Basically, when you sign up and you tell Chip Drop you want a load of chips, it's a kind of service that connects local tree trimmers who then have this stuff and would like to get rid of it uh, with basically sites where they can drop off what they have. You can't always, you know, choose your quality though. So if they've been doing pine trees, you might get a lot of pine needles. Uh, you can't always choose the amount. If they have a huge amount, uh, they're going to drop it off for you. It could be, you know, twice this much. And so you need to have a large area and a plan for what to do with it. But that being said, I do know a number of people that have used it and they've been very happy with it and it gets them what they want for free. So uh, that is one option as well. And you can also purchase it. So many landscape materials yards sell and can deliver mulch. And you can have many, many options, different materials, different grinds, different quality. Uh, and you can go in and check out your options. You can get samples. Sometimes people want uh, more of a bark chip mulch. There's all sorts of bark options. Most come from like the, the fur or redwood industry from lumber yards where they shave the bark off of the trees. And there are different options for that. We'll talk about them in a little bit, some advantages and disadvantages, uh, but the, that would be where you get those options as well. Uh, for small amounts, delivery can be cost prohibitive. If you have a pickup truck, then you can normally get loaded up there. But for just a small amount, uh, normally you're gonna be paying for the whole dump truck to come out to you anyways. And they charge by the truck delivery regardless of quantity. So the rates will vary by company and mileage. But just for example, around here, when I've had a project where we do need to purchase mulch, it's usually about an $80 delivery fee per truck. And it's uh, for a yard of material, which is about what will totally fill up the back of a small pickup truck, that's going to be, you know, maybe $50. So if you only need like half a pickup truck's worth, that's going to be a lot of uh, fee to pick that up. Some of them will also sell the, the same material in like a, uh, a paper sack that you can get as well. If you have a small car or you're doing it in the trunk, uh, Environmentally, I, I always encourage people not to find a source where you don't need to be buying a bunch, a bunch of you know, plastic bags that are just going to go into the dump. Uh, and most most of these yards can load a pickup truck with a tractor. Like I said, if you will sell bags of the same products, you cannot buy good mulch at a hardware store or at most nurseries unless they are those few nurseries that have the big uh, bins where they will sell it in bulk and load you with like a tractor or a uh, you know, piece of equipment like that. That's just from what I've seen, at least in Southern California, those bagged options are, are normally uh, just not good. And so before I forget, because we've started talking about pickup trucks, a note on pickup trucks. And this is more of a reference slide for those of you with a truck, you may do a screenshot of it or, or download the PDF. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read through every word, but basically, if you have a small pickup truck, you can normally do about a yard of mulch, or if you're getting into gravel or decomposed granite, which obviously weigh a lot more, uh, probably about a half a yard of gravel. That's that's all I'd really recommend most of the time in a, a small pickup truck. Uh, I have a small four-cylinder Toyota Tacoma. I can do half a yard of gravel 
I don't accelerate very quickly, uh, but I still feel like I can do that safely, but I would not go more. So that's only about half of my bed. But if I filled up my whole bed, uh, I don't think I would get going and I definitely wouldn't stop on time if I needed to stop quickly. Uh, a mid-sized pickup truck with a six foot bed, like a Ford F-150 or something like that, you can get about two yards of mulch and more gravel. But again, you're not gonna be filling up your whole bed with gravel. And then you know, a little bit more in an eight foot bed truck, but maybe not any more gravel. If you're gonna be pushing your weight capacity, Check actually the specs on your vehicle's capacity and check with your supplier about the weight of their prod product per yard. They'll have more detail, most likely. Remember to check your tire pressure and your brakes are going to respond much slower than you're used, used to if you're not used to really carrying around heavy loads in your truck. Uh, so be sure to drive safely. I know in my small truck, even having the, the bed completely filled with wood chip mulch, which can it can do, uh, changes how long it'll take me to stop when I'm kind of going at full speed. So always drive safely. A uh, few, few tips there. Uh, so what about those other organic mulches that I mentioned? So, you know, bark nuggets. Uh, and there's different sizes of bark that you can get, medium bark, small bark. Those work just fine for native gardens. Some people really prefer them. Uh, like Mike Evans from Tree of Life Nursery uh, is a fan of, of these kind of bark nuggets for native plants. And the reason why is because they, they do, they're, they're kind of, uh, they last a long time. And they're, they're kind of inert in a certain way. They shade the soil, they cover the soil but they don't break down very quickly. And with some of the more kind of shredded, mixed kind of wood chips, uh, they can kind of weave together over time and kind of get tight. Because I only use a small layer and I don't keep refreshing that in a native garden or, or a water-wise garden, uh, I, I haven't really had that, that problem with how I use it. But I definitely have seen in gardens where they keep piling it on year after year, that kind of more finely shredded stuff that I showed, those mixed arborist trimmings. And over time, walking on that, that can kind of form this big, thick, dry mat in our water-wise gardens where we're not really... Uh, we're not watering all of the time. And that can cause some issues. So with the bark, uh, because it doesn't break down, people don't tend to need to add more and more. And because they're these large chunks, the water, when it's getting water, just kind of trickles through very quickly. It never kind of forms a sponge. That being said, it is quite a bit more expensive and can't be found for free. So what about this color mulch, uh, the, the painted red, black, and brown sort of stuff? Uh, I don't recommend it. To me, aesthetically, it's offensive. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I've never seen a garden using this stuff where I think that's a nice looking uh, garden. Some people who use this stuff are very proud of the look that this achieves in the garden. I, I would love to tell you that that this uh, the, the dye is toxic. I tried to do some research on it and, and mostly have found out that it, it's like soy based and, uh, and doesn't really seem to be truly toxic, but but you can see the, the chips kind of almost look like ground up lumber most of the time. And uh, yeah, it normally it just doesn't look good in the garden and is mostly just available in those tons and tons of uh, plastic bags that you need to throw out when you're done using it. This is another one that I really don't recommend in the vast majority of situations, which is Gorilla Hair Mulch. And the reason why is you can see how fine this is. And this is a shredded cedar or redwood bark. Uh, you can see how fine it is, and it's kind of dusty and flaky. And I've worked in a number of gardens that had used this in the past. And this really does start to form a barrier to water getting through. It kind of compacts it for people with sensitive skin. It kind of flakes. And I don't really have very sensitive skin. It's still like I always use gloves when I'm around it. You can almost it kind of it's caustic to breathe in, very dusty and it can be flammable as well. The one thing that it does do is it sticks to slopes well in non-fire prone areas if you have a really steep slope. But if you have a just kind of a finer grind of a normal wood chip mulch, like the stuff we give away for free at the Waterwise Community Center, uh, that sticks to slopes perfectly well as well. It's not a big deal. And definitely with gorilla hair, it tends to compact. And if you're adding more year after year, I've seen it become a, a really problematic uh, barrier to, to water and air circulation. Uh, and ants tend to love to live in it as well. So I, I, I would recommend staying away from that gorilla hair. Uh, rubber mulch, absolutely don't do it. The rubber mulch uh, is toxic. There are 
problems with heavy metals in it that can leach out into your garden. Uh, and it is flammable, especially if you live in an area where you can get uh, wildfires. Uh, it basically what you end up if fire comes through your neighborhood is a tire fire in your landscape. It's, it's really, uh, I, I do not recommend using rubber mulch at all. So what about those inorganic mulches, the gravel mulches? You have a lot of different options with gravel mulches. In most cases, I'll recommend going with uh, the type of gravel mulch that's most local to the area that you're in for a couple of reasons. One, lowest environmental impact, not to be buying rock that's being transported in trucks uh, across the country. Uh, second, reason why I recommend trying to stick with what your local gravel mulch would be to wherever you are is because it's going to tend to have the most natural look in your landscape and you're going to have the most options for different sizes. So if you want to combine different sizes of mulch with stone and things like that to get kind of a nice natural look, you're going to be able to get the local material in different sizes and grades where with some of the more quote exotic stuff, oftentimes there's like just one or two sizes you can get. It's also going to be way cheaper, uh, which is oftentimes a consideration because the cost for this stuff can add up. So if you are native to much of Southern California or local to much of Southern California, uh, think about plants, but if you live in much of Southern California, uh, then some sort of kind of river rock, granity sort of gravel situation, it would be in most cases the local product. And there's different sizes within that as well. So pea gravel is a very common one. You can get stuff even smaller called bird's eye gravel. Sometimes it, it's called other things, but it's basically even a, a size or a grade smaller than pea gravel. It can be a little bit harder to find, but can be quite nice. And then you can go for larger sizes as well. well. A size that I really like to use is about an inch and a half gravel. That's just, it's not crushed. So it's just kind of uh, sifted and washed. Uh, sometimes it's called drain rock, which really is, is not a term for how nice this stuff uh, looks. But uh, this is one that I like to mix with the smaller ones to get a natural look. In most cases, you want to make sure you're going with a natural or a washed gravel for landscapes and not a crushed gravel, unless you specifically want it. Like it's very common to find a three quarter inch crushed gravel. If you lay that out in the landscape, it, it, it has a very industrial look. It just looks like utility area. You're not going to get a nice natural look for the garden. So go to the yard, check your options. Uh, most of the landscape materials yards that sell this stuff will let you if they don't have them, you can kind of bring your own, but they'll let you take a little Ziploc bag. You have a few different things if you want to take them home and lay them out on the site and, and think about what you want. A couple of other ones that are popular in Southern California are uh, one called California Gold. Sometimes you'll see one called Pyrite Gold. And this is a Southern California product. It comes more from the desert area. And you see people using it out into kind of Arizona, Las Vegas. Uh, it, it it can look nice in its own way for most areas, again, for a variety of reasons. I, I do prefer sticking with more of what would be the, the local material. Uh, and then this is, for example, if you price it out in our local yards, uh, this is going to be two to three times more expensive than our, our local kind of more granite product, which I think is in most cases going to be more attractive in the garden as well. So how do you do mulch well? Well, this is not done particularly well. And that's not to talk smack about this person. They probably put this garden in with the best of intentions. This is all one size of gravel. Uh, plants that don't necessarily thrive with the, the gravelly conditions, like these daylilies here are, are not really like low water plants from a kind of a hot reflected heat gravelly area. Uh, they'd probably prefer more of a wood chip mulch. And when, when it's just this one size all the way across the landscape, it, it doesn't look that nice. Uh, this black gravel with the reflected heat that that's going to hold in, and, and you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, I think this is an example of a gravel mulch done well. This is a DIY project. This is the first garden that this person put in in Rancho Cucamonga. It's just someone who came into the Waterwise Community Center one day and showed me the picture. And I immediately asked him to send it to me because I think he did a really nice job for that inorganic kind of mulch option where you can see there's a variety of different sizes of, 
of the, the rock and gravel, starting with a really small size. And oftentimes what you'll do is you'll get one or two main sizes to kind of cover across an area. And then you can start mixing back in. So you can see there's the other cobblestone and smaller rocks that were mixed back in. And then this dry stream bed where there's some larger things, one or two, you know, maybe really large ones if that's in your budget for the look. And then over here, he had a section where for visual contrast, there's the decomposed granite and then some rocks mixed into the decomposed granite so that there's a kind of a visual unity across this whole thing. I think that's a really nice uh, approach to using that inorganic or the gravel mulch. And if you are ordering your gravel to be delivered from a yard that has a couple of different sizes that you want to mix in naturally and you don't care if it gets mixed uh you know, as it goes along the way, you can have them just load the truck with a few different things and then bring it to you. And then as it gets mixed together, it's not really a big deal. So we're gonna move on to decomposed gra granite mulch and talking about that in this transition, but I saw a couple of questions to use or a couple of questions to answer. That just came in. So from Winnie, is it okay to use pine cones and pine needles for mulch? Uh, in most cases, absolutely. So in the south where pine forests are you know, super common, it's called pine straw mulch is super common to use. Uh, over time, that can increase the acidity in the soil if it's kind of year after year after year in pine mulch. Uh, but in so depending on what plants that you are using or your existing soil conditions, uh, you know that might even be a beneficial thing. Uh, Richard, will mulch help prevent erosion on slight slopes? Absolutely. Uh, wood chip mulch on a slight slope will normally stop erosion. Uh, Gravel mulch, if it's not too steep of a slope, can normally do that as well. Decomposed granite mulch, I will mention in just a moment, is not great for slopes because that will erode. But but wood chips or gravel, if it's not too steep of a slope, will, will usually do the job for you. And from Anonymous, what are thoughts about crushed coquina, C-O-Q-U-I-N-A, I'm in Florida. Uh, I have actually, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, so I would say ask around locally, but yeah, that's not as far as I know a thing out here. So sorry, can't help you with that one. Uh, but if you have more details about what that is and you want to type that in, I could hopefully make an educated guess for you. Uh, okay. So decomposed granite mulch, what is this stuff? Well, it's basically very similar to, uh, the natural early steps of soil formation that happens in our lower mountains and foothill areas where granite rock gets weathered and it's not quite a true what we think of as soil decomposed granite is a soil type in those areas but it's just kind of the rock that's broken down uh, and that makes a useful material to cover garden spaces in ways where it's not just our lower soil level that has more, in many cases, more nutrients, more organic matter is going to be a bit more prone to weed seeds germinating, but it's something a little bit different that we can cover the soil with that gives kind of a nice uniform appearance. Looks great in, this is a combination of a uh, desert succulent slash some California natives and Mediterranean plants in the background garden. So, you know, it kind of looks nice here, especially mixed in with some stone. Uh, and uh, yeah, that is one option in certain situations. And so when you buy decomposed granite, you can get it in one of two ways. One is called stabilized decomposed granite, and then there's just decomposed granite. Stabilized decomposed granite has some sort of substance in it. There's different products and it's mixed in. Oftentimes they're natural. Like the most common one is, is a psyllium husk based product. Uh, but basically with the stabilizer, it's meant to be laid out usually on top of a compacted layer of road base. And then it's wet and then it's mechanically compacted or very well compacted with the tamper for like a patio space, a space where you're gonna have chairs or you're gonna be sitting on or a pathway, a walking area. For your plants, you're just kind of laying it down in, in 
even layer on top. Eventually, it compacts a little bit, just kind of settles, kind of walking through for maintenance, but you're not intentionally compacting it. You still want oxygen, you still want water to be able to go through that as efficiently as possible so that the soil root zone of the plants uh, stays healthy and supports the plants well. So you're going to be ordering decomposed granite without stabilizer for your planting areas. And you really only want to use it on relatively level areas. It has many nice things about it, but it will erode uh, on a slope and it will cause a total mess if it's covering sloped areas, especially in a front yard. If it slopes down towards the sidewalk, you'll have decomposed granite on the sidewalk after it rains. And then that can become a slipping hazard for people walking by. Also, it can track. So it is best not to use it for walkways and patios that are going to be right next to the house because it can be tracked in on shoes. Uh, it will get stuck between dogs' paws. The dogs don't normally care, but they'll bring it into the house and then the homeowners care. Uh, and then once that does get tracked into the house, for example, for people with hardwood floors, that can cause scratching and things like that on the surface. So it's best if you're going to be using it uh, in your yard to have some sort of walk-off area, some area that's like concrete, pavers, stepping stones, et cetera, so that if it's on your shoes, it it'll kind of fall off as you're walking across the harder surfaces before going into the house. And then definitely have like a good mat where you can wipe your, your shoes. It's a, it's a great material for a lot of uh, situations, but just want you to know all of the details. I know a lot of people who have put it in and then they're very surprised when their dogs are tracking into the house all the time. And then it will get muddy when it's wet. And so wait until it dries out to walk on it. And then I always recommend for the kind of garden-esque visual situation, whatever type of mulch you're working with, depending on your type of garden, it often looks best to mix in some cobblestone or boulders. If you're going to be purchasing it, you'll pay for it by the pound and call around because the different yards, for whatever reason, I find at least in, in our area, uh, prices can be all over the place for the same stuff. Sometimes I've I've called around working on a project and, and one yard will literally be charging three times as much for the same pro product as another yard. But then the yard that's more expensive for one product will be cheaper for a different size of product. So uh, yeah, a little bit of calling around will always help. If you're buying cobblestone or, or uh, boulders, huge individual boulders will come on their own pallet. Uh, for me, my kind of personal thing for my garden at home is like, if I can't load it into a wheelbarrow and move it around myself, then I don't want to mess with it. Uh, and so they'll come in baskets. If you have a lot of them that you're ordering, you might order the whole pallet. Although a lot of times too, you can separate it out and the different yards have different processes for weighing it. And then you pay by the pound. And so whether it's a landscape that's a gravel mulch, and this is obviously a pathway area that sweeps into the mulch and you're using it for kind of highlights or whether it's functional. So here you can see the gravel or the, sorry, the, the boulders. Some of them as visual accents, but then some of them for this curb cut that actually harvests water and lets it sink into the garden when it rains, there's the functional support of, of making sure that the smaller aggregates in the soil don't wash out or that there's not erosion when the water is coming in for this functional uh, water capture system. And so it can be used for all sorts of things. Here is a landscape designed by Tim Becker, who is the director of horticulture at the Theodore Payne Foundation. And so this is a really nice uh, native landscape, mostly with some fruit trees where you can see the combination of wood chip mulch, but then the boulders and cobblestone to really achieve a nice natural look. Uh, and so how do you figure out how much you need and just an example of cost comparisons? Well, the internet is super useful. So you can find online these different things called mulch calculators. Just go to a search engine and type in mulch, calcula mulch calculator and a bunch of things will come up. The one I most often use is landscape calculator and it just does the simple math for you. You type in an area in square feet, rough dimensions is all you need the depth in inches that you're wanting to apply, and then it'll tell you how many cubic yards of whatever mulch material you need, whether it's wood chips or gravel or anything like that. It just does those volume calculations for you. Hmm. Okay, there we go. It does those volume calculations for you. So 
let's do some quick cost comparisons for covering a uh, thousand square feet, three inches deep. So a thousand square feet, three inches deep, uh, that's going to be a little over nine square yards of material. So that's even if it's just wood chip mulch, that's that's nine you know small pickup truck loads uh, for a, a small truck. Uh, that'd probably be eighteen pickup truck loads with what you could fit. So if you're doing a whole project, if you have some way of getting it delivered from a big dump truck, at least for that first time, uh, that's normally going to be worth the effort because it can be a whole lot of uh, truckloads to bring back and forth. Uh, we'll talk about how deep you need to go in just a little bit, but just to, for a comparison, three inches deep, for those of you who are doing the local turf replacement rebate program through SoCalWaterSmart.com. That's what they ask for is a three inch deep layer. So uh, wood chip mulch, then these prices were from uh, a couple of years ago when I priced this out. They've probably gone up since everything has. But around here, uh, on average, just the general mix wood chip mulch was going for, not including delivery, about $26 per yard. So you'd be looking at about $234. The local gravels, you're looking at you know two to three times that much. Those exotic gravels, like that California gold or other things like that, you're looking at a lot more expensive. And then decomposed granite, it's going to be more than gravel, but oftentimes less than one of the more exotic gravels. And so you can kind of see the 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 cost comparison through there. So for financial reasons, especially if you can get wood chip mulch for free, a uh, wood chip we do see is is the most common option that people often go with, and then maybe that's just that, that light layer. And then over time, it kind of gets mixed in and becomes the more kind of natural approach. So how do you select what type of mulch you should be using for your garden? We talked about the aesthetics, we talked about the sources. So it's best to base it on what conditions will match the plant's natural conditions, will make them happy. So that might be a little bit of, of research. If you look into that and then you still have multiple options, then you can think about look cost maintenance considerations. And, and also we showed some pictures of mixing some different things together. So oftentimes, you know, some part area gravel, part decomposed granite or, you know, wood chips with some rock mixed in or something like that. So for those of you in California, you know, try to understand the, the general plant community that, that the plants you're working with are coming from. If you're kind of trying to create like an oak woodland effect in your yard, then it would make sense. You know, we're thinking leaf drop, we're thinking uh, buildup of, of broken down leaves and organic material over time. If you're creating a woodland, oak or otherwise, you're probably going to be working with wood chip mulch. If you're working with a lot of our popular, colorful native shrubs, uh, things like uh, sages or sagebrushes or most of our buckwheats. Those are from often the chaparral or the coastal sage scrub areas. There, there are some from deserts as well, but most of our common uh, garden plants from those types of plants are often chaparral or coastal sage scrub. And when you look at the soil conditions there, there's some amount of, of buildup of leaf litter, but it's also often pretty lean. And so you might be thinking about gravels, you might be thinking about decomposed granites, though not on a slope like this, or that thin layer of wood chips and then letting the plants mulch themselves after they get going. But you don't need a super thick layer. You, you don't need to build up all this tons of organic matter. The soils that they come from don't have that those tons of organic matter. And very, very, very important. This is one of the most critical things that applies to any type of gardening, any type of plants, wherever you are. And one of the main things where I see people go wrong with mulch, never have the mulch directly touching the base of the trunk or the main stem of the plant, uh, because the mulch will, if it's doing its job, holds kind of water in. And if it's directly touching the base of the plant, that can promote rot and disease. The most sensitive part of a plant in most cases to uh, root rots or other kind of related diseases is what's called the root crown. And that's right where the main trunk or the main stem hits the ground and the soil right in that area where the roots start. 
And so you always want that to not be mulched. And as soon as the plant starts growing in, it's going to shade that. Uh, so you're not going to be having that evaporation. The soil is not going to be super hot there. And so you always want to keep mulch held back to a minimum of three inches or further from stems, in most cases for trees. Uh, as soon as they've, they've started growing, you know, that's more for me like six inches. And check back every so often every so often to make sure it's still that way and pull back the mulch a little bit if necessary. So especially if you're doing hand watering, if you're doing, uh, for example, like a native garden, everything's wood chipped, mulched at the beginning because that's the you know, price is right. That's what you have available. Uh, that's great. But if you're watering by hand, then over time, the mulch kind of moves here and there, here and there. And so a number of months later, uh, the, the mulch might have, have reaccumulated at the base of the plants. And so it's going to be worth your time to go back and kind of pull that out a little bit. Now, over time, those plants, when they start self-mulching, they're going to be accumulating leaf litter at the base. And you don't need to be obsessive about, you know, going every week and pulling it back. But, you know, once a year, every couple of years, take a look because in the wild, you know, it happens, uh, but in our gardens where we are very invested in making sure that that the plants live as long as possible, uh, and oftentimes we're irrigating, so we're accumulating moisture in that area around the, the root crown during the season where it's not naturally going to be wet. We don't want you know a foot of leaf litter to be built up at the base. So every once in a while, if, if you could still reach in there, pulling out just a little bit away from the base can be good in terms of the, the kind of health, best health practices for the plant. And so now we're going to kind of go through the just kind of general recommendations. If you have this kind of planting, use this kind of mulch. Hopefully this will be pretty intuitive by the time you get here because we've kind of built into all of that logic but we will just kind of go through that list after answering some questions. Uh, okay, so the, the crushed coquina is paver base. It's uh, basically, it's, it's crushed oyster shell. Uh, yeah, people, people have used that in many areas uh, for mulch for a long time if it is crushed oyster shell. It is going to be alkaline. So if you have concerns of like high alkalinity in your soil already, uh, maybe think twice about it, but crushed shells have been used all over the world for, for kind of garden mulch for, for a very long time. Well, I guess all over the world where shells are available. Uh, great question from Dan. Should we mulch in containers, five gallon buckets or grow bags? If you live in a hot, dry climate, absolutely, it can help. Uh, containers are a great option for growing for many reasons, but they do tend to need a lot of water in hot, dry climates. And so preventing that surface evaporation from just a, a small layer of usually wood chip mulch can help quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I definitely believe in that. Now, if you're doing like vegetables in containers, uh, right when you're seeding, you probably don't want that mulch layer. You want to let your seeds get up because when you water, that mulch can kind of shift around. And if you're doing small seeds like carrots and stuff like that, they can have trouble coming up through that wood chip mulch. Uh, but as soon as things are up or if you're like transplanting tomatoes or things, uh, yeah, definitely mulch. And, and it can help keep that soil a little bit cooler, which uh, especially in a container can get quite hot in a hot, dry climate if you're growing in containers. So general water-wise plantings. So for general water-wise plantings, we're talking about maybe Mediterranean garden, maybe a mix of uh, succulents, California natives here. General water-wise plantings, two to three inches of organic uh, wood chip based mulch would generally be what I would recommend. Uh, you can also, if you're going for a classic Mediterranean look, work with gravels and things like that. But for most gardeners, two to three inches of organic wood chip based mulch. Uh, if you can get a coarse brain, that's great. It'll break down slowly. If you have heavy clay soil or soil that's compacted that you couldn't really decompact before planting, a finer grind of mulch will actually naturally break down sooner and add a little bit of organic matter, matter uh, which can also help if you have lots of gravel or heavy clay soil. If you have either of those, then, then a wood chip mulch that you know will break down uh, and amend the soil some over time can be nice for uh, a mixed water-wise garden. For native plantings, California native plantings, or this can also be uh, 
lots of Southwest native plantings. That's not just a pure succulent garden. If we're thinking about plants, for those of you who know a little bit more about native plants that are from like coastal sage scrub or chaparral plant communities. Uh, but if you think kind of general colorful native shrubs uh, for people who just know a little bit about native plants, that's totally a good way to think about it. Have a couple of options. Option one, which is the most common one that I will find people will use for reasons we already talked about, is about two inches of organic mulch. Ideally, a coarser blend if you have access to it, but if not, just two inches of mulch is all you need. Uh, could even be a little bit less than that. And after that, primarily let those plants self-mulch and then integrate as much gravel or stone as desired, uh, especially in between those plants. Don't spend a lot of time putting down gravel and stone right next to the base of the plants that you know, you know, in a year are just totally going to cover up that area and you'll never see it again unless how it looked that first year is super important to you. Decomposed granite and gravel are also perfectly good options for working with sage scrub and chaparral plants. They naturally come from areas that don't have a ton of organic matter, and so you don't necessarily need to use it. And so this is just an example of kind of that mixed native planting. What about desert plants, uh, whether it's California desert plants, kind of general Southwest, uh, cactus gardens, things like that? Two to three inches of gravel decomposed granite or just a light layer of organic wood chip mulch. Uh, integrate different sizes of gravel if possible to get that nice look and make sure the plant density is sufficient to keep that landscape from feeling hot and oppressive. Unless you really, really want like this dramatic minimalist landscape, most people are not going to be happy over time if they put down a sea of gravel and a few cacti in it. So if you want that gravel mulch, Make sure you have some flowering shrubs to take up some of that space. Use some desert trees like Palo Verde or Desert Willow to shade some of that, that aggregate mulch, that gravel mulch over time. So it's not just soaking in that heat all day and then reflecting it back at night. And that will all help make the, the cacti or the succulents, the things that people often get excited about, look that much better. And then native plantings using woodland plants or forest gardening, or you know, if you're in uh here we think about oak woodlands, but if you're in the south or the northeast, kind of forest gardens, uh, three inches of organic mulch is pretty much standard, three inches of wood chip, allow plants to self-mulch as well, keep your leaves on your site, use those leaves as mulch, those natural leaves are always going to be the best. If you're planting underneath trees and you have a natural leaf layer already, don't rake those leaves away and bring in wood chip mulch, use those leaves uh, for that mulch layer. And if desired, you can integrate some gravel or stone as well. And remember, it's going to take time. So here's an example of a garden that over time is going to be oak canopy. Here's a toy on. But this is moving over the years towards a woodland situation. And so you might as well start with that uh, wood chip mulch. Naturally, if these plants were getting established in this kind of woodland garden, they'd probably be coming up in hundreds of years of leaf litter. And so put down that wood chip, start that organic matter material going and get things off to the right start. And same thing if you're gardening under, for example, an established oak tree, you're going to want to be working with a wood chip mulch. If you don't have that natural leaf litter layer, uh, you will often see people for aesthetic reasons underneath an established oak tree, or when they're planting oaks or something like that, do like all gravel. That's not going to make that tree happy over time, especially in our hot, dry climate. Uh, and it's actually, you know, if you have three inches of gravel over even the natural leaf litter kind of falling, that leaf litter is going to be separated from the soil from as that breaks down the, the soil organisms from coming up and shredding the leaf litter and bringing it back down into their little micro tunnels. Uh, if you have those two or three inches of gravel, that cuts off the process. So keep it natural for what would make sense for uh, a forest or woodland kind of garden. And fruit trees. 
four to six inches of wood chip mulch. This has actually really been studied very closely, uh, peer reviewed academic papers and all that sort of stuff because uh, orchards are big business and, and people wanna know in like an organic orcharding situation, uh, what the best thing is. Minimum of, of four inches. Four inches is kind of the sweet spot of a wood chip mulch for the health of your fruit trees to get the maximum benefits. Uh, up to six inches, six inches isn't going to perform any better than four inches, but it will basically just take longer until you would need to replace that, that mulch layer. And because your fruit trees are going to be getting irrigated regularly, whether that's overhead or drip irrigation or something, there's going to be more ambient moisture, which will drive the natural beneficial soil microbiology to break down that mulch a little bit quicker than if it was in a drier garden situation. And so you can see here this kind of, you'll see white material. If you put down wood chip mulch with moisture in a, in a uh, you know, orchard kind of situation or just around fruit trees, you're going to see white threads. This is the saprophytic fungus, beneficial fungus, basically starting to break down the wood chips and turn it into soil amendment. You'll sometimes see mushrooms come up. You'll see things called slime molds, which sometimes look like dog puke. Uh, but the vast majority of those things are going to be beneficial processes happening in the soil. Occasionally, there's a fungus that is problematic, uh, but that is really the exception. Most of the time when you see mushrooms after you start doing uh, a good mulching practice, that's going to be beneficial soil biology happening in the garden. And here's just an example of a uh, mixed use for mulch. So if you have uh, fruit trees and then other kind of pollinator plants, uh, habitat plants, cover crop, all of that wood chip mulch is generally going to be the way to go. And then finally, vegetable beds. Uh, one inch of compost used as mulch, you kind of can't go wrong for your vegetable beds. Uh, seeds can come up well through that compost. And so generally for me, in between each season, if I have access to enough compost from what I've made, we'll talk about uh, soon or what I'm able to get a hold of, I'll do a, a half inch to one inch if I have access to it, uh, top dress, and that becomes the mulch layer. And then after the spring crops are up a little bit, uh, my partner and I will do uh, about another inch of wood chip mulch to help keep those soil temperatures down, help prevent that evaporation. And then after that season, before the new crop grows in, normally that mulch has to be removed. Oftentimes we'll just rake it out and that will be the, the touching up the mulch on the pathways in between the vegetable beds. And then after the next crop is up, you know, fresh, fresh mulch will go down. Uh, oftentimes we won't really necessarily mulch the, the winter crop. Things are cooler. It's a lot of stuff that's more direct seeded, little lettuces, things like that. Uh, but summer for your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, things like that, uh, your, your, uh, melons or zucchini or squash, the mulch can definitely help. And so that's kind of wrapping up the uh, the mulch section. And now we're going to turn our way to compost because here's, here's, the, here's the kind of takeaway. Many native and water-wise plants are going to be adapted to the natural soil from where you are. They've evolved there. They're used to that soil type. They don't need a lot of fuss in most cases. Uh, oftentimes, like with our California native plants, you put a bunch of compost down, that's actually going to just accelerate the growth of the weeds. It's the, the native plants don't need that rich compost. But if you want to grow fruit trees, vegetables, or roses, then it's a great chance to turn a problem, which are food scraps, into a solution which is the best magical soil improving stuff ever, which is good quality homemade compost. Compost is magic. And for those of you from around here, uh, these are really bad jokes, but you know the, the, the soils that some of our more extreme uh, local areas have, whether it's the, the cobble in Rancho Cucamonga and Claremont or the heavy clay in Chino Hills, if you want to be growing vegetables, fruit trees, stuff that's more sensitive to soil and is water intensive, really compost is going to be your, your best way to build the soil over time that will better support uh, vegetables, fruit trees, or things like roses, if you're into roses. Uh, ultimately, 
most of our landscapes these days, especially with the, the water situation that we have, should be low water plants that are just selected for the kind of soil you're starting with. If you have very quickly draining rocky soil, there's plenty of native or Mediterranean or water wise plants that are great for that. If you have heavy clay soil, there's plenty of native plants that naturally evolved in places with heavy clay soil uh, that are perfectly adapted to that. You don't need to do much. But if you're one great thing to do with water, if you use it efficiently, is grow some of your own food. Uh, so if you're going to do that, compost can make it happen. And so let's answer uh, questions. This is a good time to take our brief five minute break. And then the rest of the class, we will be delving into compost, what it is, what's amazing about it, and techniques for making it that are practical for the home gardener who doesn't want to spend all of their time turning their compost pile. Uh, so from anonymous attendee, can we use your giveaway mulch compost for around fruit trees? I planted most of my fruit trees on the backyard slope. Absolutely, one of the best uses of it. I use the compost and mulch that uh, we give away for my fruit trees at home, and they absolutely uh, love it. Because our giveaway mulch is kind of that finer grind, it does break down uh, a little bit quickly, if especially if you're doing overhead irrigation for the fruit trees, but it's breaking down into that organic matter. It's kind of just composting in place, which is absolutely great. And because it's free, you know, you might have to replace it a little bit more often than if you had like a really fine, chunky grind of wood chips. But if you don't mind that being part of uh, how you stay in shape, then you know when it breaks down, that means that it's it's amended the soil. So that's great. And we'll talk about the compost uh, in just a little bit. But yeah, good stuff as well. Okay, so it is 10.23. So we'll take just a quick five minute break, uh, use the restroom, grab a drink, and we'll start back up at 10.28. If you have questions in the meantime, type them into the Q&A and we will start with answering questions before we jump deeply into the compost section.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are going to get started. As a reminder, for asking questions, please type those into the Q&A. We don't call on raised hands because we find that there's a lot of downtime with the audio and issues like that, stuff like that. So please type your questions into the Q&A. And did not see any new questions come in during the break, so we're going to jump right into the compost section. So what's important about compost? There's a few different things. There are some nutrients in compost, but especially from backyard compost, like we're going to talk about, the nutrient value is not guaranteed because that depends on the base inputs that are going in as well as other factors. And so in most cases, if we're thinking about compost, especially for nutrient demanding plants like fruit trees and vegetable gardens, unless you have really been doing it for a long time and have built really great soil, your compost is not going to fully offset the potential need for a well-balanced fertilizer. I always recommend organics for many reasons. Uh, that is going to make sure that you're providing for a little bit of everything that the plant needs, especially in Southern California, our soils tend to be nitrogen poor. In a lot of dry areas, the soils are nitrogen poor and your compost might not have the, the amount of nitrogen that your vegetable crops especially are going to want or your young fruit trees would really use to kind of grow in very well. But the real magic of compost is in adding organic matter to the soil, as well as supporting or adding beneficial soil biology. Oh, going backwards in slides for some reason. What's happening here? Sorry about that. All right, there we go. So what is compost? Essentially compost is fully decomposed organic matter that happens in an aerobic environment, so with oxygen. So you can get fully decomposed organic matter that's like the sludge at the bottom of your pool, that's not compost. Uh, compost usually originates from a mixture of woody material, which has chemically quite a bit of carbon in it, and a nitrogen-containing material, which could be vegetable scraps, uh, certain leaves, especially like green leaves from uh, legume plants like beans and stuff uh, can be pretty high in nitrogen and manures. Uh, but kind of the, the mixed veggie trimmings from your garden, for uh, from your uh, kitchen for the average backyard compost pile, that's going to kind of be your, uh, your nitrogen. And it's loaded with life. So what you see on the right, that's a picture of compost from my backyard compost pile. So why do we want it? Well, it's a great soil amendment for the plants that like mature soil conditions. Like I already said, vegetables, fruit trees, roses, turf, subtropical plants. It helps build soil or soil structure and soil organic matter for what can be tricky soils to garden in, like heavy clay, decomposed granite, a lot of gravel. The soil structure benefits and the chemical properties help the amended soil hold nutrients and hold water better. It also adds some nutrients. It can help reactivate the beneficial soil life and the soil food web in your garden. And that's how plants naturally are able to get the nutrients that are available to them. Nobody is going and fertilizing uh, the soil out in the forest. We're not walking out there with bags of fertilizer. This happens naturally through this whole web of soil microorganisms eating, whether it's uh, organic matter or each other and pooping and living and dying. And the processes that come out of that are going to create the nutrients that are available to our plants in a natural system. And so especially in our yards, which have often uh, for the purposes of those 
vegetables and fruit trees that are more demanding in terms of their nutrients. Those are, those are, our yards are naturally not those ideal situations for them. Uh, and so kind of supercharging that soil food web will help provide for the conditions that the vegetables and fruit trees will really thrive on. And it helps turn waste into a resource that sequesters carbon in the soil. So now in California, although it's still being kind of figured out and, and the, the kinks are being worked out, uh, new laws went into effect this year. And whoever picks up uh, your trash in California also needs to have a composting program. In most cases, people are now supposed to be putting their food scraps into their green waste, and then those will get composted because organic matter food scraps, yard trimmings going into landfills uh, create methane gas, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So that's great, but that's still putting that stuff in trucks, which are mostly from Southern California, hauled out to the desert to these big industrial green waste processing facilities. So there is still environmental benefit to doing your own simple, basic composting in your backyard, dealing with your, what might be quote, considered waste, on your site and turning it into, if you do grow vegetables or fruit trees or, or roses or anything like that, awesome soil amendment. And there's many different types of things called compost. So here's kind of how I think about four main types of compost. Homemade compost. If it's made well, usually this is the best. Uh, it can have the best soil biology. It is it can be kind of fully broken down. You can age it until it's just how you want it. However, if you grow a bunch of fruit trees or a large vegetable garden, you might want more than you can produce. So that's my situation at home. Uh, I compost all of our kitchen scraps uh, and a decent amount of stuff coming out of our garden. But my partner and I have a bunch of fruit trees and we love growing veggies and I our soil can use more compost to really support all of that uh, than we're ever going to produce in a year. So we do, especially early on, uh, bring in additional compost to really get that soil in great shape. And we've been having our, for example, vegetable garden for three years, but the, the soil was not great soil for uh, growing vegetables before that. So we're still putting down as, as much compost as, as we can reasonably uh, get our hands on. The other three types of compost are, are different types of mass-produced compost uh, that then come as products. The first one would be what I call mass-produced bagged compost. Usually, in most cases, most of the brands that sell that stuff, to me, it's not sufficiently broken down. It's not aged for long enough. It can act as a soil amendment, depending on what your local sources carry, but it's not what I would truly consider compost. And even then... Uh, there's, for example, a, a couple of brands that really are kind of like the higher end, more expensive brands uh, are more fully broken down. But I've known people who are really into uh, soil science and they've looked at those brands underneath microscopes and there's still very little life in them. And part of it is because as a bag product, they're put in bags, they're set on pallets, they might go to a nursery, they sit in the sun in the loading area for a long time. That's not great for that soil biology. So it's not going to ever have those biological benefits of really good homemade compost where all the good critters that have been living in it are going from the compost pile right into your uh, vegetable garden, for example, or right underneath your fruit trees. You can also get, if you need a lot of compost, uh, mass-produced compost that you then buy in bulk from the landscape materials yard. So a lot of those yards that sell like wood chip mulches will also sell compost, not all the time. In Southern California, I have tried in different uh, commercial scale projects that I've worked on that have needed compost. Uh, I think every yard that I've heard of that sells a compost product. And some of them in terms of adding bulk organic matter to the soil, have been useful, but I've never found anything that's truly broken down what I would truly call compost. Uh, it, it doesn't age for long enough. It's not, uh, the moisture is really hard to regulate at that big industrial scale. And so they've been useful in certain projects, but again, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them uh, compost. Some of them have come with even like unbroken down animal manures kind of in big chunks still in the pile. 
So I encourage you, if you're going to be ordering a whole bunch of it, try to look at it or get a sample. Make sure that it's something that, that you think you're going to be happy with. And then the fourth type of compost would be mass-produced compost with what are called biosolids. So biosolids are basically composted sewage sludge, which sounds disgusting at first glance. So let's let's uh, let's break that down more. So you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to use this stuff. Uh, so in lots of Southern California, we have plants that produce what's called recycled or reclaimed water. And so basically stuff from the sewer goes to these plants and the water is separated out to be cleaned and be able to be reused. Oftentimes it's like in public parks or large commercial developments or things like that. So that doesn't need to be relying on water from the fresh water supply. And then there's the solid stuff. And what is done with that solid stuff is essentially it is by using very highly engineered and regulated processes, uh, using uh, bacteria that will break things down. It is basically rendered uh, sterile. So you, and it's, you know, inspected and all that sort of stuff. And so as long as everything is working as it should be, then, uh, then all of the kind of pathogen issues and stuff like that are no longer an issue. But that stuff is still really concentrated. So what are they going to do with that? Well, in certain areas, those biosolids are then combined with basically wood chips, arborist trimmings, things like that, that are produced and need to go somewhere. And they are turned into compost. Like I mentioned, there's a, a carbon and a nitrogen. So the biosolids are high nitrogen and then the wood chips are the compost. Uh, usually these are made at regional plants and the quality will vary depending on the site and production. So our locally produced material is made by a, basically a, a governmental joint powers authority called the Inland Empire Regional Composting Authority. Uh, they have a huge facility. I've gone on a tour there when I was interested in learning more about this stuff. It's literally an old Ikea warehouse that they turned into this crazy indoor uh, composting facility, which when you are in there, it almost feels like you're in a mine. There's this huge equipment and it's turning these huge piles of this biosolid stuff. And it is highly regulated. There's temperature sensors, there's moisture sensors, all sorts of stuff. And they produce a very regulated, I've seen soil test results and stuff like that product that I've become comfortable using. It's approved for use in agriculture. And this is the stuff that we give away at our free compost uh, giveaway program that happens the first and third Saturday of the month at the Waterwise Community Center. You can go to cbwcd.org slash mulch and find the information about both our compost and our mulch giveaway programs. Uh, and it's worked really well for me. We use it in our uh, garden here. I use it on my fruit trees at home. I've become comfortable using it on my, my vegetables and uh, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, so that is the mass produced with biosolids. And in some cases I've had better results uh, with that sort of stuff than, uh, than the, the mass-produced bulk uh, compost from the landscape materials yards. It is a little bit high in salts. So sometimes what I will do, especially if it's in the cooler season of the year, is I will, uh, I will bring it home, put it in a pile, and I'll make sure it gets a few deep soaks to kind of flush the salts out of it as, as much as possible before using it in my vegetable beds. So those are the, the different types of compost that you're going to be likely to find. Uh, so here's what I'm talking about. These are some things that sometimes say compost on them, the bags from the nursery or the hardware store, but they're not quite truly compost in terms of that fully broken down or organic matter. You know, when you when you look at them, you can kind of see the components. They, they do have uh, nutrients in them, so they, they might be useful as soil amendment, but I wouldn't quite call them compost. Uh, this is about the closest stuff I found in a bagged product to what I would consider compost, and it is kind of more broken down. You can see little bits of wood chip. Uh, it's you know not super inexpensive. Sometimes I'll use. It does have some uh, soil biology kind of added back in. Uh, 
some bacteria that can kind of go dormant and act as an inoculant. So sometimes I'll use just a couple bags of this if I'm starting a new garden uh, and then mix in a bunch of the other kind of more bulk compost that I can get for free from a giveaway program here. But this is kind of closer to that real stuff. And you'll see there's always going to be a few kind of sticks or little chunks or things like that that don't break down. Uh, those can either just get incorporated if there's not a lot of them, or it can get sifted. And I'll show you that process later. And then it could, the stuff that's sifted is kind of on the way of being broken down. It's going to have some of the good biology kind of coating it and growing inside of it. So that can just go back into the next round of the compost pile. And so why is that soil biology that I mentioned important? Well, for many reasons. So I talked about the, the nutrient cycling uh, earlier on, but how does that actually happen? So what's going on in a healthy, active, functioning soil system is essentially a battlefield of all sorts of these little microorganisms kind of doing their thing, but everyone needs to eat. And so this is a scanning electron microscope picture that I love of basically that situation going on. So this thing that looks kind of like the, the big worm in the middle, that is a nematode. And this is actually a root, not nematode. So for those vegetable gardeners uh, out there, you know, the, the nematodes that can sometimes cause these weird lumps in your carrots. And then you kind of generally uh, don't want to grow carrots in that bed for a few years if, if that's the case, because they're kind of hard to uh, get rid of. Uh, that's a pathogen. There are certain nematodes, the, the lot of them that are no problems at all, but the root, not nematodes are, uh, are not great to have in your vegetable garden. And so this little strand through here is a fungal hyphae. So this is part of a living fungus. And this fungus specializes in catching nematodes. So it has these little rings of cells and it exudes a little compound that will actually attract a nematode and the nematode will go through the, the ring and those cells will expand and it will trap that nematode and then break it down and eat it. And so that's just one example of this kind of battlefield going on. So that does a couple of things for us. One, it keeps a general balance. And so when we say soil beneficial soil microorganisms, some of them are literally beneficial uh, that have symbiotic relationships with the plants we're trying to grow. Some of them, and a lot of them, are they're kind of neutral. They don't directly benefit the plant, but because they're, for example, in this case, eating things that can be bad for our plants, uh, they overall benefit the system. And when this nematode's nutrients then are broken down and then the fungus dies and there's that nutrient turnover, that then releases nutrients in a slow, sustained matter that are plant available, meaning our trees and vegetables can use that form of the chemical. Essentially think about it like there's nitrogen locked up in that living nematode. And as it goes through that soil food web, that eventually is going to get released after that nematode is gone in a way that the plant can use it. So that's just one example. We could talk about this forever. This is a thinking about not just the, the animals themselves or the microfauna themselves, but soil structure. This is an illustration of kind of an enlarged bit of soil where you can see larger aggregates. These would maybe be sand grains. You can see smaller aggregates through here. And you can see all this little stuff going on. So there's, for example, microarthropods that oftentimes specialize in eating shredded organic matter and will actually take the bits of organic matter that's not fully broken down and shred it and then poop it out. And then bacteria will break down the poop and all that sort of stuff. You can see these fungal strands through here. Uh, there's nematodes, there's bacteria in here. And all of that stuff kind of doing its work is what actually forms what's called soil structure. And so soil structure is basically kind of the pattern of the stuff of soil, the sand, the silt, the clay particles, and then the open spaces in between them. And it's literally the little soil biology, whether it's them making little burrows through the structures, 
especially for bacteria, they exude these little goos, which then help kind of bind these structures together. So if something kind of tunnels through them, then they kind of clump together. And the important part about having that good soil structure is that that's where air and water are. If it was all just compact, pure clay particles all together, there's no place for the air and the water that the roots need to be. And so having that nice structure is really, really critical. And compost can help build that structure, kind of supercharges that natural process for soil structure to be built. Humans can't build soil structure. All we can do is provide the best conditions to allow the microorganisms to do that. And then that all goes together and basically this complex soil food web where someone's eating something, who's eating something else, who's eating something else, who's eating something else, who's letting out the, the right uh, plant nutrients. And you don't need to know all the specifics about that. There's not gonna be a quiz, but just to know that this whole system is there and has evolved to, that it didn't evolve to do it, but it's evolved and one of the results of it is supporting plant life. And having this all going on is critical to plant health. And for our vegetables, our fruit trees, our higher water using plants, which often the ones that we grow are also higher uh, nutrient using plants, this is totally critical. So how best to use compost at home? I think we've established from this that you know, composting is, or compost is precious, good compost, truly great compost is, is hard to come by. You might, might need to make it yourself. And so how do, you do, how do you use it? Well, here's kind of generally my approach after trying many things, reading a lot, talking to many people, here's kind of what has worked for me as the best combination of practical and you know what I can get my hands on. Uh, in the first season only, the first season of a vegetable garden, or if you are establishing fruit trees, like that is your best chance to make your best use out of compost because it's the only time where I recommend really digging deep down into the soil. After that, you have roots growing or you have soil biology that started up. And if you're digging all around and flipping things around and digging into soil that's already going, you're crushing that, that soil uh, structure. You are taking these beneficial soil microorganisms that might be very sensitive to how close to the soil surface they are living and flipping them all around. So the first season when you're building your vegetable bed, or if you have access to a good amount of, of compost before you plant your fruit trees, you're mixing in as much compost as you can get your hands on. Uh, for my vegetable beds, if I can get my hands in most cases on up to four inches of halfway decent compost, I will lay that out on top of the bed and I will mix it down to a foot deep. I really try to get access to at least an inch of compost uh, and do that. I can't always get access to four inches, but, but one to four inches. And then after that, it's all for me what's called top dressing, whether it's vegetable beds or fruit trees or certain garden perennials uh, that need a little bit more fertility. And top dressing is basically laying it on top of the soil. So if you have wood chip mulch or something like that, you're pulling back that wood chip mulch, and then you're adding about an inch of compost onto the top of that soil. If you only have access to half an inch, uh, half an inch. If you don't have access to that much, you know, do what you can when you can. Sometimes I'll be able to add an inch to, you know, one bed one year and then an inch to the bed the next year. So, you know, do what you can, but it's, it's all top dressing after that. I don't want to dig back into the soil uh, because I want to let that soil biology really do its thing after I dig in that one to four inches to kind of supercharge things to get it started. Now, if you are, are have access to or are creating really good homemade compost, you might not even have enough to like top dress the whole vegetable bed. And so sometimes I think about those as like a precious probiotic for soil. So I'll mix in and literally kind of just bury little handfuls into the soil, uh, kind of here and there underneath my mulch layer. And that's an approach you can use as well to really get your most benefit out of a small, precious amount of great compost. You can also use compost in bulk. 
if you need to try to increase drainage of soil structure in really heavy clay soils, especially if they're compacted. Now, most of the time, that's a lot of compost and that's a lot of work. So if you have heavy clay soil and you're not growing like vegetables, I'll just use wood chip mulch, which will break down over time and really can uh, also help it achieve that over like uh, three or four years. It, it can start to make a difference. You can also use it to improve water holding capacity in very gravelly soils that drain too quickly. Now, again, if you're working with native plants, I just try to do some research and select some plants that are going to best match that soil. But if you are doing fruit trees or, or veggies and you have super gravelly soil, mix in as much compost as you can ahead of time. And then match your strategy to your compost best use. Uh, is, is it bulk compost by the truckload or is, is it really precious small amounts of homegrown stuff? So how are, is compost made? Well, essentially it's just the natural aerobic, which means with oxygen, decompaction of organic matter into something you might have heard of called humus, different than humus, humus, H-U-M-U-S. And basically that is fully broken down organic matter. It's usually like a dark chocolate kind of brown it would eventually happen automatically if you mix your materials and you just leave them. But we can also control it to ensure a nice final product, make sure it doesn't smell bad, make it far less attractive to critters and make it happen in a compact space. And also the way we do it, it, it makes it happen a lot quicker than it otherwise would. I mean, you could, in theory, just throw all your kitchen scraps out your back door and eventually they will break down. But you'll also have raccoons and possums and ants and all sorts of other stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want. And so there's kind of two general approaches or schools of thought to creating compost because there's more than one way to do this aerobic composting thing, even in a backyard situation, even when you, know, you are the composting. So most of what you have probably read about, if you've read about composting, is what would be called hot composting. And hot composting relies on adding just the right amount of material. When you hear about like turning compost piles and all that sort of stuff to keep up the heat or adding stuff in to get it hot, uh, that's all about hot composting. And hot composting is excellent. In some ways, it is truly the, the best way to produce compost in terms of consistency of final product. Uh, it definitely makes it happen quicker. But to build up that heat, which is caused by biological activity, mostly the bacteria in the compost pile, kind of take it all those nutrients and they explode in population and they're really doing their thing and they give off a lot of heat. I've found over many years of composting, it's almost impossible to consistently do well casually at the home scale. Meaning, the average person doing it at home would need to turn it into a hobby to get good results with hot composting. And that's not what most people want to do. And the main reason for that is because to get good results with hot composting, you need to build up that heat. Your compost pile needs to get to 140 degrees for a sustained significant amount of time and you usually need to then reinvigorate that pile by turning it when that temperature starts to drop. And if it starts to get too hot, which is a possibility as well, you need to stop it from continuing to get too hot also by turning it. And to even approach getting those heats, even if you have the perfect combination of materials, normally it requires at least a cubic yard of material put together all at once to allow for that explosion of bacterial activity to gain that much heat. And so what is a cubic yard? That's three feet by three feet by three feet. That doesn't sound like all that much, but let's put in the context of a small pickup truck. The back of my Toyota Tacoma pickup truck basically is a cubic yard of material. So unless you're going to accumulate that much material with a specific combination of roughly half 
nitrogen material by volume, like kitchen scraps and things like that, and half wood chips, you're probably not going to successfully get that heat. Like I mentioned, it requires careful temperature monitoring and active turning if the temperature is too low or too high. So if you are not the kind of person who wants to have your compost thermometer and be checking every day, and then one day seeing like, oh, it's dropping, I need to find time in the next 24 hours to turn this compost pile to keep things on track, uh, then hot composting might not be for you. It requires a careful balance of inputs to sufficiently reach that heat. But the good thing is it makes compost quickly at that 140 degrees for at least five days, it's going to kill weed seeds and it will kill most soil pathogens. So if you're really wanting to take everything from your garden, whether it's weeds, whether it's plants that maybe had some disease issues from your vegetable gardens and compost it, hot compost is the only way to go. But what I find is that most people, even if they intend to do that, don't necessarily hit that level of heat for that sustained amount of time. And so they might not be taking care of the soil pathogens. You need to be turning it so that the material on the very outside of the pile, which on the outside of the pile won't hit that heat, spends enough time on the inside of the pile evenly so that everything gets exposed to that amount of heat for a sufficient amount of time. Great in theory, great if you want your compost to be your hobby, but it just, most people who I've talked with over time, including people who are really into gardening, just not practical to achieve those real world results. That's not how I compost at home either. Uh, I've done it before uh, in work situations and it's just more work than I will ever wanna do at home in my garden, not worth it to me. So I like to do what's called cool composting. And we'll talk about worm composting later, which is also uh, a, viable, a viable approach for normally small amounts for people doing it casually at home. So what is cool composting? In my opinion, cool compost is what's gonna work best for the most of us who don't wanna treat our compost pile as another pet or another part-time job. Cool compost allows us to just add a little bit at a time, like the kitchen scraps we've accumulated over the last week. It's more forgiving for the balance of ingredients because we don't need to hit any specific ratio of carbon and nitrogen to generate that heat. You never need to turn the whole pile, it's just some mixing, and even that can be somewhat optional. So it was less work, you need less space. In many situations, most of the time, it will attract worms to it over time. Uh, most of the time in my cool compost piles, I never add worms or anything, they just kind of find their way there. Uh, even if it was, for example, my compost pile in my place at home, like it was an abandoned yard. And that section of the yard, probably been decades since anyone took care of it like a, a, a garden or, or watered. But after doing my compost for like a year or so, like there's just worms in the compost pile. So, all right. Uh, and there'll be more worms or less worms depending on the time of year, but they'll, they'll go in there, they'll, they'll help, breaking it down, help break things down. And worms aren't really gonna spend much time in a hot compost pile. It's, it's way too hot for them. Uh, the disadvantage is that it doesn't kill the weed seeds or the pathogens because we're not building up that heat. So weeds, if they have gone to seed at all, go into my green bin. Uh, diseased plants, go into the green bin because they're going to be re, uh, industrially compost, which will take care of the, the pathogens at that heat level. Uh, but all of my kitchen scraps are going into my compost pile, as well as smaller, more tender weeds and trimmings from the garden. And so what's the key? The key is a balance of what you could think of as greens and browns. So good, and good smelling compost is a balance of high nitrogen and high carbon ingredients. Basically, our, so our microorganisms in our compost are going to take off when they have enough nitrogen, and the carbon is kind of that long-term sustained nutrition that they need to kind of process and be turning things into kind of compost. Too much nitrogen, and it'll be a smelly, sludgy mess, too much carbon and you'll you'll not really fuel that breakdown of the materials from the carbony kind of stuff into compost. So common nitrogen inputs, vegetable scraps, lawn trimmings, farm animal manures, 
not cat or dog waste. Uh, there are some people who use a very specific process we're not even going to talk about to successfully do that in a very different kind of composting. But uh, farm animal manures. So if you have access to uh, goat, cow, llama, rabbit, chicken manure, all of those are, are great high potency nitrogen inputs and green leaves. Uh, for the average person, the vegetable scraps from the kitchen are going to be the main nitrogen input. Uh, common carbon inputs, wood chips, arborist trimmings, and straw, not hay. Hay still has the seed in it, which is the nutritious part if you're feeding it to animals. Uh, but that seed is going to germinate in your compost pile uh, for cool compost, definitely. And uh, and yeah, it's, it's not what you want. Uh, straw, to me, is not quite ideal. It kind of tends to mat down. If it's what you have, you can totally make it work. Uh, but I, I really am a fan of the wood chip and arborist trimmings. And for this, uh, a finer grind is really going to break down a little bit quicker. It's kind of been pre-processed more. There's more surface area for the soil microbiology to work against. So the, the uh, for those of you who are local, the mulch that we give away at the Waterwise Community Center, that's what I use for my, my uh, compost pile. It is a finer grind, it works super, super well. Uh, that's all the, all the carbon input that I use. And so to keep it simple, you can think about it by volume. Aim for about 50% by volume, high carbon ingredients, and about 50% by volume, high nitrogen ingredients. Home compost ingredients and what to avoid. So that 50-50 is the generally the way to go. For a home compost pile, avoid meat, oil, and generally dairy. Little bits of dairy, kind of just fine. Uh, if there's like oily kitchen scraps from, you know, you've fried up a bunch of veggies or stir fried some veggies and uh you know like the stuff left in the bottom of the uh the pan like that's generally fine but you don't want to like dump out a bunch of oil into your compost pile uh meat will tend to go rancid uh at the kind of small scale cool compost kind of uh backyard situation and again if you have you know some of those small animals uh not cat or dog or human poop then then their poop is good for a a boost of nitrogen uh, let's see, see if any questions are come in. Uh, so there is a question about compost juices that normally is relevant to worm compost. And we'll talk about that when we do worm compost. And I think that's it. Okay. So let's talk compost piles and containers. You're going to need to put this compost pile somewhere. You know, it's 50% kitchen scraps, 50% wood chip mulch or some variation of that. Uh, the compost doesn't really care that much. You could have something just like that, but in most suburban backyards that might attract critters. And then the around the edge, especially if you have these kind of areas where like all the citrus rinds there, those are gonna attract flies and kind of get kind of smelly. Uh, the container is, is mostly for our convenience and there's no perfect compost container in all situations. Uh, most have pros and cons. This is my go-to in most cases. Again, there's no perfect in all situations, but in most cases, this is my go-to uh, compost bin. It's what I use at home. Uh, if you find something else like it, you know, I'm, I'm not like brand specific, but this happens to be the only brand that I've seen with this kind of approach. It comes kind of tightly ro rolled up in this tube and then you unroll it and then there's these little kind of uh, pegs that you use to put it together which means you can expand it to make it much wider than this or you can have it be about this wide and you'll see a uh, kind of a run through of how i set up and maintain my compost pile using this in just a little bit why do i like it well it works well and it's cheap so that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much the reason. Uh, if it works well and it's it's cheaper than uh, the other options, why not go with it? Uh, I was turned on to this geobin system by a great, I uh, can't remember if it's a single or a series of YouTube videos done by the California Master Gardener Program, where they basically did a head-to-head -head compost bin uh, comparison, where they took the same inputs kind of treated things the same way for the same amount of time and compared a bunch of commercially available uh, compost systems to see what created the best compost. 
This one created the best and it was the cheapest. And the reason why is because most likely that compost needs good airflow. All of these microorganisms, remember this is an aerobic process. There also needs to be some moisture to it. And as these microorganisms really get going and their populations kind of explode when they're feeding on all this stuff, they need oxygen. And so this is a very aerobic environment with all of these perforations. It can take a little bit more work because of that to keep it uh, moist and hydrated, uh, but it works well because there's plenty of airflow. You can absolutely make your own. I mean, this is really just something to contain this stuff and allow airflow. Uh, you can absolutely make your own out of like deer fencing. And I've done that in the past. Uh, if you are going to be making a bunch of compost bins, then this can be the most price effective way of doing it. But if you just need one or two, by the time you buy the roll of deer fencing, uh, unless you have other uses for deer fencing, it's going to be more expensive. The other drawbacks of doing the doing it uh, with this style of DIY is that you do need to be careful both in building it and as you're working around your compost pile, the, the edges where you would use like a, a wire cutter or a bolt cutter to cut this deer fencing tend to be very sharp, sometimes actually file them down, but you can cut yourself on it. And this, if you're in a hot, dry climate like Southern California, actually in my experience is, is a little bit more airflow than is ideal because the whole sides are open. Uh, it's just kind of this wireframe kind of holding things together. There's so much airflow that, that it does tend to dry out more. And then occasionally too, uh, you'll just get your veggie scraps kind of falling right out the edge of it where this does a, a little bit better of a job or significantly better job kind of keeping all those aspects balanced. Uh, but is an option, and I definitely have done it before, made perfectly good compost. This is kind of when people think of a home compost bin often more what they think about. And these are fine. I, I do know people who have great success with these sorts of bins. And you can see similar looking bins to this for everything from this was, uh, price has probably gone up on this a couple of years ago, uh, but you know, a little less than a hundred dollars to like $300. Uh, so more expensive is not necessarily better. Uh, but what are the advantages of this? So one of the advantages of, of this is that it, it is very contained. You're not gonna have problems with you know, like raccoons or squirrels digging around in it. Uh, I don't really have those problems with this, but like, for example, if you know that there's a bunch of rats that live in your neighbor's ivy, you might wanna go for a more contained sort of system. You, you, you'll know your own property uh, or your own community space where you're doing this. Uh, if you are in a community garden situation and you really need to kind of keep any critter issues under control, you know, this can be a way to go. Another advantage is that with the cool composting system, because you're kind of adding stuff and you're not flipping the whole thing, the compost on the bottom of the pile is going to be ready before the compost on the top. And so we'll talk about different ways to manage that. But one of the different ways to manage that is to have a system like this where you can open up just the bottom and pull the finished compost out of the, the bottom and, and everything kind of just shifts down. So that is one advantage. Uh, another advantage is that it does hold the moisture in better because there's less airflow. Now the disadvantage is the exact same thing. Uh, you need to keep it on your moisture because you can develop too much moisture. And if you get too much moisture, it can start to go what's called anaerobic, not enough oxygen starts to get stinky and smelly, and you can lose some of that beneficial soil biology. So it's all about what works for you, uh, but this is definitely an option for some people. And I do know some people who prefer this option to kind of this option, which, which I tend to prefer more. Uh, the tumbling barrel composters. Personally, I've tried to use these I've talked to other people who have tried to use these, and I think these are kind of junk. Uh, they tend to be pretty expensive. This one's $94. I've seen them for much more expensive than that. But the problem is that most of them, uh, they can't actually hold that much material in them. 37 gallons is not that much more material you can see compared to this one, 94 gallons, uh, this one up to 246 gallons. And so that's just not a lot of material to hold enough moisture, to have enough biological activity going on. And if you uh, 
the only reason to, to have this kind of tumbling situation, in my opinion, is you don't need to turn it if you would need to turn it. But with cool composting, you don't need to turn it or worry too much about funneling all that aeration to keep the biological activity up. So you don't need something like that. On the flip side, if you're actually trying to do hot compost, 37 gallons isn't enough capacity to really build up that sustained heat for that biological activity that you're going for, even if you are turning it all the time. So it's, it's just, to me, these systems are kind of the worst of both worlds. Uh, if anyone here has created great compost with this, please type it into the chat or Q&A because I'm always curious about it because so many people buy these. But so far, I've not talked to anyone who has used these and, and actually really has loved them. And then there's all sorts of fancy either DIY approaches or wood kits to purchase. In general, I don't think they offer that much and mostly are designed for hot compost systems. So a three bin system, which could look like this. I've run three bin compost systems where it's, it's uh, like cinder blocks that create these three bins. If you are going to try to do a hot compost system, they're really nice because basically what you can do is you, you accumulate your material and whatever you need to flip it, you flip it from one side to the middle. And then you always have a, a final side where you can let the stuff that you're done kind of doing that process with just kind of age out. But for cool composting uh, and the average kind of backyard composter who doesn't necessarily have that much space or is not wanting to spend that much uh, budget kind of getting their compost going, that often tends to be a little bit much. If you are trying to do uh, hot compost, though, uh, the three bin system is something to definitely look into for a kind of backyard scale, not using tractors. That has been the most successful for me trying to do hot composting. So let's hop into just my recommended system for most of us. Uh, okay, couple. Uh, one question that just came in for compost inputs. Did you say that coffee grounds were okay? Yeah, coffee grounds are awesome for compost uh, as part of a diverse mix. So I wouldn't necessarily do like all coffee ground, grounds for my nitrogen, but definitely uh, any coffee grounds you could produce at home if you're composting your kitchen scraps, all of the coffee grounds, and we make coffee every day at my house, uh, go into the compost. Or even like if you work or have a friend that works at a, uh, a coffee place, even bringing in up to a significant amount of extra coffee uh, can be uh, great. Just kind of experiment. And if it ever seems like it's too much, uh, sometimes the coffee can stay very wet at the beginning, uh, then you can uh, you can kind of tamp it back a little bit. But if you have access to coffee grounds, they're, they're great to go into a, a compost pile. Okay, so recommended system for the average person at home who doesn't want to spend their life taking care of compost. Here's kind of where I have landed. Uh, this is my kitchen counter. This is a stainless steel pail. There are more and more different designs available. I think Ikea even has like some, some very reasonably priced uh, coffee, I mean, sorry, plastic ones that uh, are great for coffee grounds and all sorts of all that sort of stuff, kitchen scraps. Oh, that's great. But you want to have something very convenient, ideally on the counter, just for kind of as you go throughout the day to accumulate your scraps. I like this one that's stainless steel because it's really easy to clean. The disadvantage with the stainless steel containers is that for some reason, all of the ones that I have ever seen, and I've tried to look a couple of different times, basically they have holes in the top and they advertise what they call like a little carbon filter that goes in the top and is supposed to kind of like reduce it from smelling bad at all. If it's starting to smell bad in your kitchen, it's sitting here for too long. That shouldn't be an issue. And all that happens with those little black kind of fabric carbon filters for me is that inevitably you get muck from kitchen scraps or broken like junk from the kitchen that you want to compost all caught up in it and it's hard to clean. So I always don't use those. And I just have packaging tape across the top so that it, it seals it off a little bit more because if you just have them open, it will smell a little bit bad. Uh, and every once in a while, um, my partner and I will have to change that out like a couple of times a year. So if you could find a, a container that doesn't have that, 
know, that's ideal, but that's that's been the system that works for us. But the stainless steel is great. It'll last forever. It's not going to break or crack like plastic maybe would. And so all the all the compost from uh, the kitchen or all the kitchen scraps go in there. And, you know, every day or two uh, that gets dumped out. If we're if I'm cooking a big meal where like it's a lot of veggie scraps, sometimes I'll take it directly out. Uh, but most of the scraps will kind of go in here, also cleaning up uh, anything left on the plates that's not meat after a meal goes in there as well. Uh, when we wash down the dish drain or any little veggie scraps or general scraps in there gets knocked off down into here. Now from here goes to an intermediate. And if you want to, you can go from here out to the compost pile every time. That's just fine. What I like to do is I like to then go to a, a five gallon bucket with a lid and fill up one to two five gallon buckets over the course of a week or so. And once a week to once every week and a half, uh, depending on how much I accumulate, then I will dump that out in my compost pile. It just makes it less work. Uh, if you really want to keep things uh, fresh and not getting stinky at all, then you can go from here directly out. For me, uh, having these five gallon buckets it does, it's not stinky outside, but when you open that five gallon bucket, it's starting to get a little stinky in there. It's so it's a little bit of uh, sometimes in the summer, a little bit of anaerobic decomposition starting, uh, but it's it's not necessarily that bad. You can figure out the pace that works for you. If I had, I could say like my act more together and I was prioritizing my compost pile more, maybe I would go from there straight out. But that's just, I have a lot of other stuff I do at home. And so it's just more convenient for me to accumulate more and then do it all at once, a little bit more periodically. And so once I have accumulated, you know, one or two of these, uh, then it is compost pile time. So this is kind of unwound. That's that geo bin system. And here you could see it basically is just this kind of rolls out like a rug. And then you fold it over however wide you want it to be. And you use these little pegs and they kind of twist in there and kind of support it some. So here's an example of, you know, sometimes it flops a little bit after it's been, had the stuff sh weight shifted around for a while, but you know, no big deal, doesn't matter. Uh, and most of the time the compost pile isn't gonna be like front and center in the yard. So I don't care that it, it looks like this. This is like the farthest corner of my yard. Uh, if you have a very small yard, you might want one of those more rigid bin systems that really keeps everything kind of just so. And so here, this is, I tend to have two piles. I have enough room for that. So I'll have, this is the pile that's you know finishing, getting ready to harvest. And this is the pile that I am going to be adding to. So I kind of set that up. And this diameter is, is about the size that, that tends to work best for me. This one's a little bit wider over time. I'm kind of finding the right balance for the amount of kitchen scraps we're creating, you know, how long I want to be adding versus, versus letting it kind of uh, finish up cooking down up to you. So this, this tends to work well. And the bottom, I always start with a good layer of wood chip mulch, uh, two, three, four inches of wood chip mulch in the bottom, because you really want that bottom to kind of drain well after you, you've watered it. Uh, you could probably do less, but that's just a, you know, a, a good way to go, uh, having kind of a, a nice good carbon layer in the bottom. You know, I just use the, the wood chip mulch that uh, we give away for free at the Waterwise Community Center. Uh, any purchase kind of bagged, wood, or not bagged, uh, none of the bag stuff. You don't want to use bark nuggets, but those mixed arborist trimmings, uh, that's perfect. So most of the mulch giveaway programs and local communities, you know, that stuff will be just fine. Here's, you know, up close. If you can get access to a finer grind, that's always going to be the best. And so there you go. And so to start this compost pile off, here's basically what we had for the example. And normally to start it off, I'll, I'll have maybe two five gallon buckets, but you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's cool compost. It's not, it's not rocket science. We would need way more. We basically need to like almost fill up that whole bin uh, to have a good chance of doing good hot compost. So this is what I had to get started. It was pomegranate season. Uh, so that's great. And so you kind of dump it out. And this is what it's going to look like at the end. You can see all this brown, that's coffee grounds. Uh, and so you dump it into here. And remember, we're, we're going about 50-50 between kitchen scraps or nitrogen. So you can have some lawn trimmings, uh, some 
some farm animal poop if you have, and the wood chips. And so you add it in a layer. And if you really wanted to, you can just layer it. But things both break down quicker and will be less smelly if you kind of mix it together. So uh, a kind of garden fork, something like that is an essential tool for me for composting. You can use a shovel if you really want to as well. If that's what you have, and you don't want to buy anything new. It won't be a flat shovel, but like a spade shovel can generally work. I like a fork. And then you, you mix it together. You know, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it's just instead of having stratified layers, I always am adding the veggie scraps or garden scraps on top of wood chips and then mixing them around just a little bit. It's not trying to dig the whole pile. It's just mixing so that the closest layer of wood chips is mixed into the layer I just added of veggie scraps. What I will normally do then, and I forgot to take a picture of it, is I will then this kind of needs to be kind of rinsed out, but our compost piles, especially in a hot dry area, also wanna have a decent level of moisture. And so what I'll do is I'll rinse that out with the hose a couple of times, and I will dump that on to add some moisture. The perfect moisture for a compost pile is to be kind of like a wrung out sponge, where in theory, if with a gloved hand, you really squeezed on a bit of it hard, you can get just one or two drops of water out of it, but it's not saturated uh, and it's not super dry. That can take some regular watering. I'm, I'm, I'm probably supplementally watering it about once a week uh, here in hot inland Southern California. And if I really, really wanted the compost to be perfect, uh, I'd probably do it maybe even a little bit more often than that in the, the hottest part of summer, but it's cool compost. It's casual. Sometimes it dries out a little bit more. Sometimes I catch up on the moisture. It is what it is. Again, if you're trying to do hot compost, you really need to keep that moisture level pretty perfect. And then what I always do, both so it's ready to go for next time, as well as to prevent it from being stinky or from attracting flies or other critters, is I always cap it off with more wood chips. And so I generally do that by volume, meaning I've just added that much. And so I will literally, after I rinse them out, take those same containers, fill them up with wood chip, and then put that across the top. That kind of forms, literally, it's carbon. It's like a carbon filter. So that kind of holds the smell from getting out. And it means that next time when I have my scraps ready, I can just dump on there and mix again. And normally I will, for a compost pile this big, I do find that having about two buckets, five gallon buckets, is enough uh, kitchen scraps to have a good layer of kitchen scraps and then enough wood chips to then have a nice layer of wood chips on top of it when it is done. And then the other thing that that does is that after being rinsed out and everything, that leaves just a little bit of wood chip dust in there, kind of dries things out. And again, that's just a little bit of, of carbon. If anything, it'll make the, the accumulation of the scraps uh, a little bit less stinky. And so basically you do that. And, and it's funny because you'll do that and then you'll feel like you're building it up so quickly, but then as it starts breaking down, it starts losing kind of volume again. So it, it is amazing how long you can keep, even if you go through a lot of veggie scraps in your kitchen, how long you can keep adding to this uh, pile. It just kind of seems like it, it's going and going. So I'll normally kind of add on to it for about six months, and then I will stop adding on to it. And then I will, while still kind of keeping, trying to keep the moisture going, I will let it cool pile. So it takes a while. I'll let it age down and finish breaking down for maybe about another six months. And so my personal schedule is I keep two piles going. I have one that I kind of let age down and I harvest the compost out and I amend my vegetable beds and maybe a little around my fruit trees right around my spring planting season. And then Southern California, we can plant our veggie beds in spring and fall. And then another pile that's aimed to kind of be finishing and ready to go around my fall planting season. And so I'm always have a pile that I can add to, and then a pile that's going to be ready to use in time where it's the perfect time to be amending my soil. And so let's check in on a finishing compost pile. And so because we're not doing a lot of flipping or anything, and it's a cool compost pile, when you are gonna set it to be finished, you're always going to do a thick layer of wood chip mulch to finish it off. And that becomes like an insulating layer. That layer is not going to break down. That's just going to be kind of, that's like a layer of mulch, like you're mulching your garden. It kind of shades things, uh, holds in the moisture a little bit after it gets watered. 
And so, but then checking in, you kind of pull that back and you can see this is much more broken down. Here is a situation where the last kitchen scraps were added about three-ish weeks ago. So you can see there's a lot of uh, wood chips still. It's not fully finished compost. You can still identify things, but you can't identify any of the vegetable matter. That stuff starts to break down much more quickly. And then the nitrogen in it is what's gonna power the more woody material to continue to break down. And if you're doing your job right, it's gonna smell like the forest floor. Uh, it, uh, when you are doing your, from your five gallon buckets into your fresh compost pile, it's not going to smell like the forest floor right away. But this parts of the compost that have started to break down by the time it looks like this, that should kind of start to smell like the forest floor. If it smells stinky or sludgy or like sewage, that's either too much nitrogen or it's too wet and you're get, starting to get anaerobic smells. And, and in that situation, just make sure it's not too wet or add a little bit, you can always add a little bit more wood chip to try to uh, alleviate anaerobic conditions. And then here's what I was talking about. You know, so there we go. It, it's a worm bin that, that did not get set up as a worm bin. It figured it out. And in the cool compost pile, they are helping uh, get things going. And, and in the summer, the worms, I think, tend to go farther kind of down more into the soil or into the lower parts of the uh, compost. I don't see them as often. And then in the cooler time of year, they'll, they'll be back around. In Southern California, you will see these guys quite a bit in the compost as well. Uh, they look like these crazy huge grubs. Those are fig eater beetles. They turn into the, the iridescent green uh, iridescent green beetles that fly around. They look crazy. They're harmless in compost. They just eat breaking down organic matter. The adults though, will go after your figs or tomatoes in their adult form. And I like growing figs and tomatoes. So what I do is because the rest of my garden that's not veggies or fruit trees is a habitat garden for native birds, butterflies, lizards, and things like that. Uh, these things are delicious morsels for kind of medium and large size birds. So near my compost pile, we have a little dish and we'll put them out. And by the end of the day, the birds will have come by and we'll have really enjoyed uh, snacking on these guys. And that way I have slightly less fig eater beetles than I would otherwise the next season around. And so here you can see kind of in process and you can see here little bits of, you'll see kind of white, this is, saprophytic fungus, fungus kind of doing its work, breaking down uh, the parts of the carbony material, which are not available to be broken down by bacteria. The fungus goes to work first, then the bacteria after that. That's part of why it takes a while. The bacteria works very quickly. The fungus works slowly and certain things need to be processed by one kind of organism before it can be processed by another sort of organism. If it smells bad, the bad smell is anaerobic decomposition, and that's not what you want. So yeah, you either need more air, more carbon, or less moisture. And adding some mulch that's starting dry and some air will usually fix it because that will make it be a little bit less wet. It'll add some more carbon and you'll get some air in. Should smell either neutral to forest floor. And so how do you get some air into the compost? Well. You could just kind of dig around with your fork and turn it around. And if you really have to, to do that, you know, you can. If you are having one of those systems though, where you have a single rigid bin and you're trying to pull the finished compost out of the bottom, every time you turn it, you're adding fresh material back down to the bottom. Uh, there will be things you can buy online if you want that are like compost aerators and they're these big corkscrews and you can pull them out and things like that. Uh, I've tried those before. And they work decently. Uh, I showed someone who is a very, very knowledgeable and very practical uh, gardener and ecologist that one time. And she said, yeah, that's great. I do the same thing with a piece of rebar and it costs $2. And so then I tried it after that. So it was just a, a piece of cut rebar from the hardware store. You can get it in the, the concrete section and it works pretty well without having to turn it. If you just want to get a little bit more air in for whatever reason, I don't need to do this often, uh, but uh, you can kind of stick that in your compost pile and just kind of move it around in a circle and you'll kind of create these openings that'll get a little bit more air in. And so kind of jumping ahead, 
uh, after maybe being left to finish for about six months or after six months from starting your pile, if you have one of those uh, single piles that it flows through and you harvest from the bottom, look at sifting the finished product. And so this had normal real life, you know, this, this had gotten a little bit more dry than would be ideal, but it was still good stuff and it will still work very well. So this wasn't a huge pile. So this is what I'm left with at the end, kind of take the top off of it. The top part that's not broken down just goes back into the compost pile. And here you can see though, this is compost. This is fully broken down sort of stuff. And with a few larger chunks, you'll see some avocado pits, uh, some larger chunks of mulch. And so up to you if you wanna sift it or not, it is work. Uh, and it depends what your final product is for. If I'm going to be using my compost at fruit trees that I have wood chip mulch on anyways, I'm not going to bother to sift it at all. Uh, if I'm just top dressing it for vegetable beds, I might lightly sift it. Uh, but if I'm going to be adding wood chip mulch on top of it, I might not care. If I'm going to be mixing it into the soil, I'm definitely going to be sifting it because those big chunks of carbon uh, in the soil are not what you really want. And so your sifter doesn't need to be crazy or expensive. Like people sell soil sifters or compost sifters. This is generally what I like. I try to find, you know, from a nursery, just like if you're buying four inch pots from a nursery, a nursery flat, some of them have big wide kind of patterns at the bottom, but there's a type of them that has a small diamond pattern at the bottom. And that works perfect. Just kind of put a couple of shovels on there, shake it over a bucket. And this stuff is great to go back into the existing compost pile that already has some of that good biology. And so you can see, even though it was kind of dried out by the time it was done, you know, here's what I have pretty much fully broken down, uh, great compost. And you can see there, there's some structure to it there. It's, it's, there's, you know, little gaps that naturally form in between. It's quite nice. Uh, there'll be little bits of sand and other stuff in there as well. And like the little twigs and things like that, you don't need to get that out. That's just fun. I just try to get the big chunks out. And so if you're in a hot and dry climate, where do you put your compost bin? Well, shade is ideal. It will help retain the moisture in the summer. If you can put it in a place that gets all day shade, that's great. A lot of us don't have that. Uh, if you can't put it in a place that's all day shade, and you could put it in a place that at least gets shade in the hot afternoons, that's better. On top of bare soil or wood chip mulch is really ideal. If all you have is on top of uh, you know, concrete or asphalt, then, then go for it. Uh, but the when you water your compost bin, uh, eventually you're gonna need to water it enough to that water is gonna kind of soak through. And so on bare soil, the soil can just absorb that. It's not gonna run off. Uh, it will also allow, you know, like worms to show up. And then if the worms need to leave because the temperatures are too high, uh, the worms can go back down into the soil. And then because you need to be adding water in every once in a while with an easy range of a hose is critical if at all possible. And then ideally you'd have it, you know, somewhere where next to it, you could store your, your carbon materials, your wood chip mulch, whether that's in an open pile or in a trash can or some sort of other improvised bin or something like that. And so we already talked about uh, the one pile versus two pile strategy. So in the interest of time, we'll go from, we'll kind of skip over this, but just remember your old pile as it's being allowed to cook down. If you have two piles, that still is going to need moisture to keep it from drying out. So basically whenever I am adding and then adding a little bit of water into my new compost pile, I'm also gonna quickly just check my old compost pile and water it if it needs it. Um, the other thing you can do is if you like the kind of more open container and you only are going to have one pile, you know, every once in a while you can take the open container, the geobin kind of system, uh, you can take it off your compost pile, put it next to the compost pile, kind of flip everything that's still breaking down back into it and just harvest the finished compost from the bottom. And so that's kind of the, the once through on cool composting and kind of the what I think is the practical way that most of us can be successful with compost at home. I've seen a few different questions come in. So we're gonna answer some questions and then we'll wrap up talking about worm bins and worm composting. Uh, from Donna, what about paper products? Uh, paper products are just fine to compost. Uh, 
if you have a shredder at home anyways, shredding the paper so that there's kind of some loft to it uh, is a great way to go. Too much, just like full pages of paper can kind of, when it's wet, can kind of mat down and cause kind of weird clumps. And so uh, crumbling up paper as a way to kind of keep some loft in it works well. It's, it would be tricky to have like all of your carbon be paper because it does kind of, when it's moist, like to mat down, but some paper is definitely good. Corrugated cardboard, uh, the beneficial fungus really loves the glues in corrugated cardboard that break down and, and that paper is fine. So sometimes I'll rip up some chunks of cardboard. I have a small pile of uh, cardboard at home from uh, packaging where it's almost like that honeycomb and there's like a lot of air in between. I'm going to rip that up and add that to my compost pile this weekend. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be adding to my compost pile. So that stuff is, is great a little bit here and there. Uh, junk mail with sensitive information on it that, you know, maybe you would burn, compost it, uh, you know, rip it up some, get it wet, add some water, mix it in with your veggie scraps, you know, in a, in a day, all that information will be gone. Uh, so yeah, that could work as part of it. Uh, so from anonymous, I add Bokashi powder. Bokashi powder is a whole other kind of composting. Kind of cool, worth looking into. We can't really cover it, but it's a very controlled anaerobic style of composting uh, into the five gallon bucket with the lid before putting into the soil to reduce a little bit of a smell. Do you think it will help to break down quicker and increase the microbes and so on? I mean, adding Bokashi powder, is it worth it to buy? Honestly, that's a good question. My my one thing that I really understand about Bokashi is that Bokashi powder is to have success with an anaerobic uh decomposition process, which is why it will make those five gallon buckets if you're accumulating stuff less stinky. I'm not sure how active or beneficial it will be once you put it into the compost pile, which is an a aerobic system. So uh, I'm not sure. Pine needles. Pine needles don't break down very quickly uh, because they kind of have a waxy coating. It's part of their drought adaptation. Uh, you could probably do some, but I, I don't think pine needles would work for like the, the entire compost part of it. Uh, but I'm not really sure. Uh, how about from Winnie? Is sawdust from tree debris, wood chip, a good item to add to compost? No, absolutely. So true sawdust, like if it's from a wood shop, is extremely high carbon, like so much carbon that it could cause some issues. So you'd only use like a little bit at a time. But generally, like if you had tree work done on your property and it's just the kind of the mix of everything that's left, that's just fine to add as your, your carbon input. As long as the trees weren't diseased. Uh, yeah. So uh, can you lay down gardening cloth at the bottom? from Eleanor. I mean, you could, but again, you want, you want air, you want nutrients, you want uh, worms to be going back and forth. And the cloth at the bottom, I don't think would really help that much. Over time, all those fine little things that are going to be breaking down in the compost, the fine particles might clog up that cloth at the bottom and might make it so the water can't drain through the bottom if it needs to. Uh, so I don't normally, I don't really see the advantage. Once you have your pile, you probably won't really be getting weeds growing all the way up through it. So I probably wouldn't bother with that gardening cloth. If you think you are going to have weeds uh, because that area is very weedy, lay a few sheets of corrugated cardboard down at the bottom, which is kind of also called sheet mulching when it's being done at a large scale to take out a lawn. And that'll just kind of keep any weeds from instantly coming up when you get started. But then that'll probably pretty quickly break down and then it, it won't form a long-term barrier that could interrupt uh, soil drainage and things like that. Uh, okay, so let's, in our last bit of time, hop into worm bins. And then when there's the question from earlier about juices, uh, we'll go from there. A uh, quick question that came in from Mario before we go on. Can you add barbecue ashes? Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit. You, you wouldn't want to do a ton, uh, probably like if you are grilling all of the time, unless you have a big compost bin, uh, I, or a big compost system, I wouldn't do all of them, but a little bit here and there would be just fine. Uh, also things, some of you will think this is totally natural and cool. Some of you might think this is a little bit gross, uh, but like I cut my own hair at home. Uh, my hair goes into the compost. Uh, 
my cats when I need to brush them uh, because they're shedding, like all of that goes in. Uh, that's great nutrients, uh, fingernail, toenail clippings, things like that. All of that will break down very well in a compost pile. Just add some nutrients back into it. Good mineral matter. Uh, okay, worm bins, made simple. Worm composting is a great way that people without a yard space for composting or a tiny yard can still compost. It can produce a very high quality supplemental compost product with great beneficial biology and a quicker turnaround time than traditional composting, but lower volume. So you might do both. Uh, the worm compost, the biology in worm compost as that like kind of probiotic where you might be like burying just a little bit here and there in your garden to give it a boost or even in some of your potted plants. Absolutely excellent. But for most of us with our worm composting, we're not going to be producing like so much compost that we can top dress our whole veggie garden or anything like that. Uh, it's a lower volume situation unless you build all these huge worm bins, unless again, it's like a hobby, but it's a fun thing to do. It's a fun thing to keep going with kids and to like look back in and see how things are, are being eaten and see what the worms are up to. It's more of a responsibility than a compost pile. Uh, they're almost like little pets. I mean, way less responsibility than a cat or a dog. If you're wondering if you can handle a cat or a dog, maybe try to be successful with your worm compost first and then go from there. The main tricky thing with worms in hot inland Southern California is you need to keep your worm bins cool. Compost worms, uh, red wiggler worms are, are, are composting worms. That's what's used. There's you know many, 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 many different species of worms. Red wigglers are, are what are used in worm composting systems, uh, like the big white earthworms. They like to live lower down in the soil and they don't process the organic matter as quickly. That's red wigglers. Uh, but they need to be kept cool. You know, in a, in a true soil situation, worms can just go farther down into the soil uh, if it starts getting hot up above. And soil, even just a, a foot down or a few inches down is normally about 55 degrees. So if we have them in a worm bin situation, anything above 84 degrees can kill worms. Uh, so you need to have a way to keep them cool. That's honestly why I don't currently have uh, a worm bin at home. Me and my partner used to have worms, but even keeping them in the shade, hot inland, uh, a few years ago, we had that, that heat wave where it was like 113 degrees outside. Even in the shade, uh, the, 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 uh, the temperature in there got hot enough that the worms could not survive. Uh, there was some openings on the bottom. I'd like to think that they escaped down into the normal soil. I'm not sure if some of them probably perished. Uh, but since then, I've known that, well, one, uh, I have worms going in my cool compost pile. And if it gets too hot up in there, they can just go down into the soil and then come back for that great food source when they want to. Uh, but to eventually, I think I'll, I'll do worm compost again, but I'm going to need to take them into my house, which is doable because it, it should be clean if you're doing it right. But I'm going to need to take them into my house uh, during an extreme heat wave situation. And I just haven't gotten, you know, all of that together and got it set up again, which is just fine. Uh, you don't need to be doing everything all of the time uh, in a garden. And so that's the situation. Uh, you're going to need to have a way to keep things below 84 degrees in their ambient soil. Critical. Uh, buying a worm compost bin will normally cost you about $100, but you don't need this. Uh, so there was a question that came up about the juices. Uh, so normally the juices, or sometimes it's called leachate, you know, if you have a normal kind of in the ground compost pile, if there are any, you know, extra juices, liquids, the water is run through, uh, that's just going to go down into the soil. In a worm bin, often times uh, at the bottom, and this is one of the things that that these, you know, worm bins that you would buy uh, market on, you know, why they're great is because that then there's like a little spigot at the bottom. And sometimes it's called worm tea. Sometimes it's called leachate. And they say, you know, that's great stuff. And you can pour it on your plants and stuff like that. You know, if you're generating it, you can. But the honest situation is for a worm bin, uh, it's similar moisture is what you're really trying to keep to keep the worms happy. And you need to be more on top of the moisture in a worm bin because worms, if 
the soil dries out, they're, they're going to either leave or die if they can't leave. Uh, you really want to aim for that wrung out sponge kind of consistency. So if you're generating a lot of extra liquid that's leaking down below kind of the main area of your worm bin, you have too much moisture. You shouldn't be creating a lot of this leachate. So you, you don't really need this. If you're creating this, there's always already something kind of off in your, in your worm pile. So we will get in just a second to what I recommend as the less expensive alternative. If you have that already, or if you if you want that because that's nice and neat and you like how they stack or whatever, that's great, go for it. But you don't need to spend $100 on a worm bin. Uh, you do need worms though. If you know someone with a worm bin, you could save money and get some from them, or you could order it online. Occasionally, like local nurseries will have them, but not that often because you know there's a there's a pretty quick shelf life on these things. So normally you're you're getting it from a company. Some areas have like worm producing operations and they will sell you worms as well. Where I am locally now, I don't believe that there is one. Usually to start a worm bin, you'll start with about 500 worms or so. And that there's going to be a, a cost to that. That's about $45 plus shipping. Last time I checked, you could start with fewer and then kind of slowly add more. Uh, it's just the more you start with, the more you can feed them. If you start with fewer, you're just going to need to kind of experiment and make sure that you're not accumulating so much food that it's like the worms aren't going through it. You, you kind of just trial and error, kind of find that balance. Uh, and sometimes when you order a certain amount of worms, the, the, there'll be instructions with it about how to get them going. Uh, worms really, really love melons and melon rinds. So if you know someone with the worm bin, and you're trying to get some from them. Uh, you know, you can like cut half of like a cantaloupe or something like that, uh, enjoy half, leave half for a couple of days for the worms. And then when a bunch of them go into it and are on it, you can maybe take that would be one idea. Uh, so worms, red wiggler worms are different than night crawlers, which are often the white ones. Oftentimes those are used for fishing bait. I think maybe occasionally red wigglers are as well, but I'm not really a, a person who knows anything about fishing. Uh, they're not native. Uh, neither are the night crawlers in California, but they're often found in good garden soil these days because they've become established in many areas. And so what containers need is basically bedded. You need some sort of ambient structure for the worms to live in that then you can feed and you know put that food into. Uh, you can use mostly finished or finished homemade compost. That would be something great. Oftentimes these days, people use what's called cocoa core. It's a shredded kind of compressed, uh, it's kind of from the holes of coconuts and it's available either online or from hydroponic stores. Often it comes in a condensed brick. You put it in like a bucket or a wheelbarrow with some water. And usually the, the block has the, the instructions for how much, for how much. And you kind of, it kind of forms this fluffy uh, product. Traditionally, people have also used shredded paper, like really it needs to go through the shredder, but that's kind of harder to manage the moisture on because it, like I said earlier, it does kind of become waterlogged and compressed and it doesn't really have the loft for the worms to travel through. So cocoa coir is, is often uh, what I've used and it works well. So why do you feed your worms? If happy, worms will eat up to half their body weight per day, but they'll slow down in cold weather. It's a bit of trial and error. If you have too much food, it's going to excessively rot and attract flies. Worms really actually, they eat the veggie scraps, but what they're feeding on truly are the bacteria that's just starting to break down the veggie scraps. So a little bit of rot's not bad, but if there's all this rotting food that the worms haven't, haven't uh, eaten, that's gonna start giving off anaerobic smells, that's gonna attract gnats and things like that. So you'll find your balance. As the worms expand in their population, then you're going to be able to feed them more and more. Vegetable and fruit scraps are generally good, but they don't like acidity. So no citrus, no pineapple. They also don't like onions, garlic, anything like that. Uh, generally, no banana peels, especially if it's inside your house. Uh, the thing with banana peels is that oftentimes there are uh, fruit fly eggs, even from our, our bananas from the market. And when you put them in a worm bin, they'll kind of start living very happily in your worm bin. If you are gonna use banana peels, make sure that you actually wash them off pretty well. Try to deal with that. Particularly great for worms are greens, lettuce, kale, anything like that. Uh, melon, apples, 
coffee grinds in moderation. Uh, coffee grinds are actually not heavily acidic because most of the acidity ends up in your coffee, but, but a little bit. So a little bit of coffee grinds are good. Avocado, they love. Uh, root vegetables are slower to break down, but like little bits of carrot tops or things like that are fine. But also the greens of things that oftentimes we don't use in the kitchen, like just the top part of carrots or the top part of turnips or things like that. The smaller the pieces, the better. So, you know, sometimes people will, will even uh, chop up a little bit ahead of time. I've heard of some people even kind of doing a rough, like blending, kind of making their worm smoothies. I've never tried doing that, but if you're interested in the idea, you can look into it. So here's my approach to worm bins, works pretty well. Uh, just a low wide storage bin. And with storage bins, in terms of the plastic, you normally do get what you pay for. So the really cheap, rigid plastic ones uh, are not going to last as well outside. The the more heavy duty, like Rubbermaid style ones uh, that are a little bit flexible and just seem a little bit tougher, they're more expensive, but that's really what I would recommend. And then worms uh, need air. And so you're going to drill a bunch of holes. It doesn't need to be rocket science. Uh, this has worked out pretty well. Uh, since I had this system, I've, I've read that maybe these holes should be a little bit bigger, uh, probably do like quarter inch holes and there's nothing perfect for them. You need a bunch of holes in the bottom for drainage. Remember that if you have like a corrugated bottom in the lowest spots, you should definitely have holes because the water's gonna accumulate there. This bin worked great, but probably if I was to do it over again, I'd do some holes closer to the corners and, and in this other lower spot, and then along at the top as well. Uh, you can always add some more holes if you think it's holding too much moisture or not staying iterated enough. You know, you just do it with a drill. And then you find the place for it. So shade, you want it to be in the shade if you're in a dry climate for sure. So this was underneath a grapefruit tree in my yard and you want it to be in a place that's going to uh, naturally stay dry so you can control the amount of water that you're adding. This is just an old sprinkler that was not currently active or else this would not be a good place for it. And when it's raining, you're going to want to have holes in the top of this by the time you're finished setting it up. I just hadn't drilled the holes yet here uh, for that airflow. But then also what I like to do is in the cool season, I'll take an something else could be a little piece of plywood. Uh, oftentimes for me, I'll just have some extra other storage bin lids, lids around because I don't always use lids on my storage bin. So something else to put on top and, and put a rock down or something to keep it covered. Or if it's going to be an area that gets hit by sprinklers, when you have a sprinkler system going, uh, cover that part up so that it's not getting water dumped on it all the time. And then here's, so you can see here's the actual lid that I use. And here is checking in on the worm bin. And so you can see getting closer, this is the quar with moisture in it and the scraps added in. Little bits of cardboard, uh, the worms actually really like going through and eating and breaking down the cardboard. And you can see here uh, charred stems. There was some leftover charred little bits of greens after chopping up the chard from my kitchen. They like breaking that down. This was kind of just getting it started. So there's not a ton of worms in it, you can see some of them. And also you won't see them as often at the top, but then you can see here, we have our worms here. And then there's lots of little baby worms. If you look closely, kind of where's Waldo style uh, and our population is just starting to expand and you can see them breaking it down. So harvesting strategies. You want to separate your worms generally, and you don't need to get every single one of them out if you're adding it to your veggies, but you generally want to separate your worms from your food. So you'll kind of let them just kind of break down the veggies in their bedding for a while, and you'll, you'll start to see the kind of the texture change. You can kind of tell that there's more broken down or called worm castings in there. And so then you're going to get ready to harvest. My favorite strategy for harvesting is to then just start feeding only on one side of the bin. And after a number of weeks, a couple of weeks or so, all the worms, after they've broken down all the remaining food on the one side of the bin, are going to travel to the other side of the bin. And then you could just take out the worm compost. If there's still a lot of worms in there, sometimes what people do is they'll make little piles 
And then the worms will travel down to the bottom of the pile if you like put it out on a table or something like that in your yard. And then you can separate them. Uh, but I wouldn't even normally bother going that far. Most of the worms will go to only where they've been fed. And then if you have a garden with lots of organic matter in the soil that you've been building up, the worms will be perfectly happy in your garden soil as well. So where to locate a worm bin? Just to review, shade is necessary in peak air heat waves. If the ambient temperature is going to be over 84 degrees, they need to come inside. Garage in Southern California is generally not good because the garages get too hot as well, unless it's climate controlled. And where they can somehow be covered from rain in the winter, either under an overhang. In the winter, the garage is often fine in most areas in Southern California. Uh, or you can put you know, something like an extra bin on top of them. So that's that's really the uh, presentation. I hope this has demystified compost and mulch for you and given you some straightforward practical strategies to use at home. I'm going to kind of go into answering questions. Uh, there are lots of other resources that the WaterWise Community Center has for you, including an online resource, if you haven't seen it, that I encourage you to check out. I forgot to change the slide. We have just renamed our Inland Valley Garden Planner website to be called the WaterWise Garden Planner, but you can still use the same link. It'll just redirect. All about choosing plants and learning about landscape design for Southern California. Definitely check that out. Lots of good stuff. Our upcoming workshops, our past workshop recordings, where you can also review a recording of this, as well as coming and visiting us at our demonstration garden, open every day except Sunday, free in Montclair and again, sign up for our newsletter. So I am going to jump into answering the final questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Before you leave, I'm gonna very quickly launch a very brief closing poll uh, evaluation. Please let us know how uh, you think this workshop was. Uh, my colleagues and I always really take a look at these and really want to also learn how we can do what we are doing better. So in addition to just the poll questions, uh, I always read through the chat. And if you have more comments for me, uh, the comments are even more important than the results from the poll. If there's anything particular that you feel like you learned that was very practical or you are going to put to use, I'd love to hear about that in the chat. If you didn't hear uh, some of the information that you were looking for. If you didn't get what you were looking for out of this workshop or have anything more critical that, that wasn't working for you in the way that I taught this, I really wanna hear that as well because we are always trying to take this relatively complicated information and uh, share it with the community in the clearest, most possible way and make sure that people are getting what they are looking for out of the workshop. And so with that, I will jump into answering the questions. I like that from Gloria, the worm placement. If you're comfortable, the worms are comfortable. That's a great way to think about it. Uh, interesting, some great things in the chat from Karen, uh, from Sharon. Freezing fruit and veggie scraps helps add moisture to their bin. That's also a, a great way. If you have some great worm scraps that you know they'll really like, but they just don't need food right now, uh, you can have a Ziploc bag in your freezer of just kind of like extra worm food. Um, okay, so let's go through. From Sharon, found Coco Quar bricks at a 99 cent store for less than $2 a brick. Really interesting. First I've heard of that. It's great. Uh, from Carol, did I miss info for where to get wood chips? We're located in Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, so a couple of answers for you, Carol. First one is, although we are out of it today, if you want to come pick it up yourself at the WaterWise Community Center, we normally in our parking lot, which is just open all of the time, keep one to two big piles of mulch that are donated to us through a relationship with the Green Army, which is a local place where arborists drop off their wood chips. They shred it up and they uh, drop it off for us to share with the community can be a need for free. Uh, today, we've been going through a lot of it recently. We are fresh out. Hopefully next week we'll get another delivery. You can always call WaterWise Community Center uh, and just talk with during the week, whoever answers and ask if we currently have a mulch available because we all see it in the morning when we 
park in our parking lot and we'll let you know. Uh, if you are looking to get a large amount delivered, there's a number of local places that you can go. And for those of you in our local area, if you go to our WaterWise Garden Planner website, and I'm going to type that into the chat right now, water, it's just WaterWise Garden. I'm making sure I'm typing it correctly as I talk, planner.org. Uh, there's a lot of great information there, but there's uh, on the top kind of navigation bar, there is a section you can go to and click on called resources. And if you go to resources there, scroll down a little bit, there are lists of for our local area where you can find waterwise plants, where you can find landscape materials. And in there are the places locally where you can buy and then also very importantly, have delivered uh, many different kinds of uh, wood chip mulches and things like that. Uh, or if you only need a small amount, like if you're using the wood chips for your uh, compost pile, uh, then the stuff we give away for free, I think works great. That's what I use for my compost pile. Uh, but if for some reason you need to buy some, you can also buy uh, just, just a small amount from those places, I believe as well. Uh, Okay, I think that gets us through all of the questions. Thank you very much for spending your Saturday morning with me talking mulch and compost. And I hope you have a great West rest of your weekend uh, and hope to have you join us in future workshops. Goodbye.